What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. So one thing that Lou Elizondo told me and that he's told this to other people and he said it in the show Unidentified, one of the biggest things, surprisingly, that he ran into with opposition within the Pentagon, within the Defense Department to the work that he was doing, is that there was a very large contingent of people that believed that this was a demonic force, as in demons, and that we shouldn't be doing it. We shouldn't be investigating it. We shouldn't be poking the tiger in the eye. They thought the phenomenon that was being witnessed was demons? Yes, within the military establishment, within in the Pentagon, within DOD, there was a large number of people that opposed his work because they thought from a very, very fundamentalist viewpoint that we're dealing with demonic activity. You ever see aliens out in Arizona? You ever you know, look out in the desert and just see a UFO floating right there and give your life some meaning? I'm camped out in Sedona right now, right? Mm -hmm. And I've lived there off and on for going on 10 years spread apart. It's supposed to be one of the most relevant UFO hotspots anywhere in the world. Really? And I still haven't seen a UFO, even in Sedona. And I lived for years right on the ocean overlooking Catalina Island. Another yeah. UFO hotspot. Didn't they and film something there? They recently? did. Yeah, uh, Carolyn Corey did a tear in the sky where she brought in mm. a bunch of people, and they used these cameras to triangulate, and they supposedly found a bunch of stuff coming up out of the water. Pretty compelling evidence. I lived there for the longest time. I never saw anything. I brought Ed Grimsley, the guy that used to do. He was the the guy that invented the idea of using night vision goggles to find UFOs. Mm. Um, I brought him there with another guy, um, the UFO summoner that supposedly <laughs> could, could call UFOs. And, and he did, no, this guy was for real. He would- um, Are we sure? He, yeah, he would, he, well, <laughs> I don't mean for real like yeah. that. This guy, uh, what was his name? I can't remember, but it, he calls himself the UFO summoner. Mm. And he would go to parks in downtown LA on the weekend and he would gather crowds and they would all summon ufos and you'd see these ufos flying through this the skies of downtown los angeles and he'd have these pictures uh, in his little picture book and he would say yeah these are all ufos and i'm like well it's a Sunday morning in downtown Los Angeles, and these look an awful lot like birthday balloons. In fact, that one looks <laughs> like a 14. <laughs> and he'd say, well, they don't want you to know they're UFOs. Mm. And I'm like, so, okay, this is a real conversation. I'm like, okay, please explain this to me. You're saying that they're UFOs, but they look like Mylar balloons because they don't want us to know they're UFOs, but they want us to know they're here. And when you call them, they're coming. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's the contradiction right there. <laughs> so I've actually had some of these people on my properties in in on uh, overlooking the ocean. The reason I'm using two hands is because one time I had one in Laguna Beach, mm -hmm. and another time I had one right on the ocean uh, in San Pedro. Mm. And both times we did all kinds of experiments trying to get UFOs and photograph them, and I did not have any luck at all. Have you ever, I mean, we've heard certain patterns with UFOs over time. One of my favorite topics to just like, think about is the whole like nuclear part of it and going over nuclear bases that's very interesting and very compelling around the world when you look at those reported sightings not just here but in russia and other countries but when it's not something like that and it's things like the desert or certain parts of the world do you ever like do you ever find yourself putting together exactly why they may go to certain places well you know you think about it a certain amount of time that certainly there's a reason that you could ascertain for why they're interested in nuclear sites. Um, the, sure. the Randallstrom Forest thing even was supposedly, it's still classified, but supposedly there was uh, nuclear weapons on that base. And mm. then you and then you have the stuff with, uh, with Robert Salas and Faded Giant, which was a real thing. Uh, so, and, and then of course Roswell was supposedly, that was um, the Army Airfield where the Enola Gay was headquartered. Yeah. So that's where the first nuclear bombs were actually launched and deployed. So there's, there's, and it makes some sense that they'd be interested in our weapons, but then, you know, why they show up at other places, there's, 
no real way to have a consistent kind of theory as to why that happens. Because for one thing, there could be things going on with the earth that we don't know. So, you know, we know about things like ley lines and we know about that, that are, that are theoretical. We know about energetic power grids, theoretical, but they could be real. And there could be reasons in different spots on the earth where these places interact, where there's, uh, you know, walls of dimensions that are thinner that we just don't even know about. Walls of dimensions that are thinner. Yeah. Well, think about this. Okay. Okay. I'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> there's an energetic fabric that, that basically is, matter it's all basically energy vibrating at a certain frequency to give us the illusion of matter there's theories of multiple dimensions mm -hmm. it stands to reason when people talk about portals well what does that what does that even mean what's a portal right they talk about it at skinwalker ranch you see scientists talk about it you see people that don't even know anything about any kind of science talking about there being portals well what is that that is a place theoretically where you're going to see energy uh, that divides different realms be thinner. And so there, there's that could be going on. We don't know about it. We don't have the science to prove it yet. Mm. But there could be a lot of reasons why you see quote unquote UFO hotspots where the reason they're hotspots is not apparent to us. That's, the, that's my issue with the entire phenomenon in and of itself. We don't know how these civilizations would think. Something as simple as like the Wawa down the street could be the thing for some reason that has like their holy grail that they want to look for. And we'd never f know why, you know, because they're, they're like, obviously, you know, Dr. Kaku and some of the things he talks about with these different types of civilizations, mm -hmm. type zero, one, two, three. Sure. To get all the way to a three, which he said would take, I want to say that one was like another 100,000 years for us it's or something. It's shit. a, it's, I think it's even longer than that. So think, either way, think about the, the, power of human ingenuity across you know 8 10 12 15 billion people as the population grows just to be able to get there and how much more they would know we could not we'd have trouble having a conversation with people from 150 years ago what do you think we do with people you know when it's a hundred thousand years from now or something you know so that's the one part where i'm like how can we really even concept it like nu the nuclear bombs one that makes a ton of sense but the other things like we're just kind of guessing, no? We're guessing in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, you know, you, you brought something up that would be really kind of a big let the air out of the tire kind of moment. You know, we, we have this perception of self-importance. Like maybe the aliens are coming here because they have some interest in us. Mm. Or maybe they're coming here because, you know, they want to nurture us into a galactic family. Or maybe they're coming here because we're some kind of experiment. But to find out in the long run that some alien was able to see into the future and realize that there was going to be a wahoo and they're only coming here for the sandwiches, that would suck. <laughs> yeah. I, the, the thing about the whole interest argument, though, like you and I were talking shortly before we got on cam, joking about Neil deGrasse Tyson and like what he said about that, where he's like, oh, they wouldn't have any interest in us. I mean, I guess technically, like you can't prove for a fact that he's wrong, but I don't, I don't agree that we wouldn't be interesting. And this is where it can it can kind of finger off into a lot of different rivers of possibilities here. Like if if we looked at our planet and were able to figure out, for example, just throwing this out there, that like, ooh, we're a simulation. Well, then if we're a simulation, the whole point of it is to be interested in us. Right. You know, things like that. I mean, that means it's like they created the Sims and we're the Sims, you know? Yeah, you know, the difference between living in a simulated reality and us actually being Sims is that there are outside forces that control the Sims. You know, like the, us with our computers, we're just manipulating them like puppets. And so even though I'm kind of a subscriber to the idea that this is some kind of a simulation, I'm not sure that we're manipulated puppets. But we might be, mm. and we don't know. You know, the whole thing about AI, like in, in movies like Blade Runner and, and what we're seeing with, with emerging AI, is that we have these artificially created beings, real or from fiction, that don't know they're artificially created. And that's, that's and, and more and more that seems like it's coming out where you can create what we would call an artificial intelligence, but that doesn't mean that it is going to perceive itself as artificial. It will think that it's alive, you know? <laughs> and so maybe if we are artificial thinking that we're alive, it all boils down to why, what's the purpose? Sure, we could be in a simulation. Sure, there could be aliens. Sure, all of this could be something that we don't even understand, but there's gotta be a reason for it. And ultimately that's mm. the ultimate answer is what is the reason for all of this, whatever it is. 
Well, that's the that's the elusive question that we'll be lucky if we ever get to point zero 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 one percent of it. It's like, you know, I, that I'm I'm obsessed with the idea of Einstein thinking he could find the theory of everything. I think it was such a noble thing as well. And obviously genius scientists contributed a ton to, to the world. But like if you could actually like read the mind of God like that, whatever it or that is, think about like we can't even concept the numbers of dimensions it would take to even get there. We may not even have a concept of what that number is. Like we say trillion and we think that's like an insane number. That could be like point zero 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 one of what it really is because numbers are infinite. You know, like this is the stuff that keeps me up at night, not even like when I'm high or some shit. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> me too. And you know, it's true that um that you know, Einstein was after the theory of everything, right? I mean, you know, he died with paperwork and formulas on his desk. Mm -hmm. And the theory of everything as it relates to physics is, as you know, is basically let's come up with a mathematical formula that explains how reality works. Um, that, you know, how the physical universe works, how the laws of physics works, how everything clicks. And the reason they can't find one that's cohesive, and th this is my opinion, but it, but I've done a lot of research on this. I'm not a scientist. You know, I think one of the last we'll people get to you had you here was Cockrew. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't want to sit in Dr. Cockrew's chair and act like I know anything about the physics. But it has been proven that physics cheats. If a feat needs to be accomplished that does not fit within the laws of physics, it has ways of sidestepping the laws of physics to accomplish a task in the real world. And I could tell you an example of that. Yeah, it's actually, I thought I knew what you were saying, and now I'm hearing that. Maybe I don't. Please give an example. Okay, so there's this thing called quantum photosynthesis. Yes. Okay, this is a scientifically proven thing. For years, scientists couldn't figure out why a plant was able to find the most efficient route for that photon to get to the root where it's turned into energy that grows the plant. Out of all the ways that a photon could pass through this plant, it always, if you track the photon, would find the most efficient route through the plant. What they came to discover is that this plant was collapsing into a quantum state where it sent the photon on all past possible routes through the plant, then collapsed back into the physical reality and took the most the most logical route. Yes. So the, basically what it's doing is it's sidestepping the laws of physics, going into a quantum state outside the laws of physics to determine its best possible way of executing the task within physical reality so what that's proving to us is that is that stuff can cheat so it's, it's impossible to find a theory of everything because a theory of everything has to be this is how it works 100 percent of the time we can prove it with algorithms but if if the very way that reality works enables it to do things outside of any rules then you can't come up with a theory of everything because you can never estimate the extent to which it can break its own rules and quantum photosynthesis shows us that that it's possible and that it's probably happening this might be a really dumb take what i'm about to say but i'm just trying to synthesize all this no pun intended if everything is infinite including shrinkage meaning like we have string theory that says it's like the smallest form of matter we've ever discovered but we still have to test it well below the strings there has to be something below that microscopic uh, to the microscopic if, right if, if you catch my drift so when you're talking about the theory of everything it's only based off of things that we've at least concepted before when even like quantum itself like the like the photosynthesis the word that gets tossed around a lot but not that many people really understand what exactly it means. I, and like i don't even pretend to have a full understanding at all and i've talked with people like dr kaku who've written sure. books on it it's like do you believe in god well i believe in the god of einstein he believed in God, but not the God that intervenes in human affairs. It was the God of order, the God of simplicity and elegance. Einstein was asked the question, did the universe have a choice? Is it unique? So universes, you can create universes in an afternoon, but most of them are unstable. Most of them fall apart. Most of them don't work. Our universe is stable. It works. Everything fits together. And then the question is, what set off the bang? That's what we do for a living. We have the Big Bang Theory up to the point where the universe is going to explode. Why did it explode? We think it was a quantum event. And we are here because we are in the universe which decided to explode. So Einstein said, was it all an accident? And he thought, no, it could not have been an accident. To me, I still, I'm, I'm up at night, I'm like, I still don't really... Like, I get it at the atomic level, but like all this shit. But 
on the photosynthesis thing, it's like if they're if that process is happening and the way that it it I'm saying this in really layman's terms, but the way that it spreads around so quickly to be able to process it through the entire plant exists and it definitely does at something way smaller at the microscopic level that we've never even concepted before, then we don't have anywhere close to the information, just the way I'm reading it as a layman, to be able to say what everything is if we can't even measure the things that make up the everything. Exactly. It's a, and, and as uh, like one of my friends, John Alexander said, um, we're not at the stage where we're asking the right questions yet. And so what is that I'm the saying- general? Uh, Colonel. Colonel but, yeah. but what I'm saying is that in order to have a theory of everything that explains how physics works, how the universe works, how it came into existence, we have to we have to know a lot more than we know. And that's why this has been so elusive. It's like E equals MC squared. This little four, five um, uh, line formula was supposed to explain everything, but it, but it doesn't. And people, scientists, our best scientists are trying to come up with this thing, this simple mathematical algorithm that explains everything. And I don't think that it's possible because you can't take randomness into effect when you're trying to come up with a definitive formula. Mm. Now, I could bite that off for a while. We could go right down that rabbit hole. But for people listening right now who haven't heard of you before or know what you've done. I, no, that's I, a heck of a way to start yeah, a conversation. That was, that was a great opener. We'll, I mean, I will we'll not do that in a bar. It's like, hey, babe, I got a minute to talk about the theory of everything. <laughs> this is my number, though. It's not a formula. <laughs> no, you just got you got to direct them to your documentary. But you, you recently came out with a great film, highly informational called accidental truth and how long did you work on this this was this had to be like five six years right well the film itself took me about a year and a half to edit yes um and some of the interviews that came out in it weren't even shot before i actually started the film but the actual material some of it goes back to 2007 when i first interviewed some of these people oh some of it goes all the way back to 2007 i yeah, didn't know that yeah. like i you know i've interviewed nick pope like three or four times and the first one was in i think 2008 and for people out there who is he uh nick pope is a former british ministry of defense ufo desk guy when i was growing up he used to write a column for ufo magazine <laughs> and it, i was like wow here's this government guy being you know talking to the community and i thought that was pretty cool and um yeah and so you know here we are all these Allegedly. years later <laughs> yeah. so you obviously had an interest in this for a long time but in your doc which i'll put the link in the description for everyone to go buy it and check it out i, I definitely recommend it but in your doc you went at it from all different types of angles I like this. It reminded me, as far as like the number of angles, it, it was reminiscent of the phenomenon, which our mutual friend James Fox did. Oh, yeah. It almost seems like they're watching us, like a god a little bit, if this is the case, to make sure we don't destroy ourselves. So I interviewed a number of eyewitnesses regarding that aspect of the phenomenon, and that is particularly during the Cold War, the height of the Cold War. They are witnessed in Russia and all scattered across the United States. And this launch control officer, Robert Salas, I'll never forget this, he said, well, James, the message I got when they shut our nukes off it's almost like they were taking matches out of the hands of a baby. But I'm fascinated at, at the fact that there are now so many of these people who are talking, be it the Lou Elizondos, the Chris Mellons, some of the colonels and generals you've spoken to, who have kind of come out in recent years and started to talk about the phenomenon. And, you know, my little my little red light sensor goes up right away and goes aha like sure. what's what's the agenda here but when you're going into this and making the documentary are you suspicious of that at all or are you do you trust the information you're going to be getting from them because you're sitting right across from them and you feel like you could get a read for it you know that's interesting because at the very beginning of the documentary the the only time you really see or hear much of me is because matthew modine narrates it which is great but at the very beginning i say something like uh i'm sitting in these rooms alone with people that have run secret weapons programs interrogated terrorists protected closely guarded secrets for a living and all i can think about is getting them to tell me something they don't want me to know mm. and at the end of the day that's Pretty much every interview that I walked into where I knew that I was dealing with somebody like that, that was in the back of my mind. 
And I would ask questions designed to try to get some kind of information out of them that was beyond what they're actually willing to say with their words. Guys, the Julian Dory podcast fashion collection is officially live. So hit that link in the description below. Go get your gear just like this and show off your favorite show to all your friends. Let's get it. And that's what Accidental Truth is about. Um, I successfully did that with, with Elizondo. I did it with Christopher Mellon. Um, Gary can, you, can you explain to people who don't know? A lot of people listening absolutely will know, but for those who aren't as familiar with ufology and things, who, who is Lou Elizondo? So Lou Elizondo is the... In 2017, the New York Times broke that story about the Navy studying UFOs, mm -hmm. and that was a guy named Ralph Blumenthal, uh, Leslie Keene, and there was another... I can't remember her name. There was another writer that helped break that story, um, and I apologize to her for not getting it. But um, the uh, that was a story that came out and said, yes, the military has been studying UFOs since 2004 or slightly before that. And we've been seeing things that we can't describe. And Lou Elizondo came out as a guy who was actually running that program. Which it's called they, it A-TIP? They called it A-TIP. Uh, there's a lot of controversy around that, but uh, my investigations are, have revealed that it's pretty much what he says is, is, is true as far as this pipeline of info, but Lou Elizondo ran that program and came out on 60 Minutes saying, we might not be alone. And that was the first time. Fed. Yeah, that was, <laughs> exactly. Fed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Serving the agenda, but you. <laughs> now the agenda is to admit that we might not be alone. I, lo uh, I love when he like pauses and he's like, if I say something else, I may say something I'm not allowed to say. It's yeah. like, okay, all right, Lou, we get it. We well, get yeah, it. I mean, but you know, the thing is, is that I think that there's there's three layers to all this. The first layer is that there are people, and they're very few and far between, who have the big picture as far as what's happening with humankind's interaction with non-human intelligence. And those guys have been in the shadows since the 40s and even probably further back than sure. that. Now, those guys, we're probably never going to know who they are. And with generational stuff, with lack of institutional memory, they may need, not even know who they were originally. A lot of this information people think is in some big vault somewhere. And my investigations have revealed that these guys have no problem destroying evidence and that there could very well at this point in time not be anybody that is in possession of the cohesive story and the evidence chain going all the way back to the 40s. What do you, what do you mean? Can you expand upon that? Yeah, which part? Like the, so no, you're saying that like the government... Like, I have a hard time believing that with even the biggest secrets of mankind that maybe multiple governments are working on, I have a hard time believing that any evidence would be completely destroyed. Well, we found we found plenty of evidence that that's the case. The um, But is it tertiary evidence to something that they don't destroy the evidence for that therefore is actually the center of it and they just kind of destroy a few documents that might get people on the right path? Well, it's more like, you know, at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, when they go and there's this big warehouse where everything's stored. Yes. Okay. There might be a warehouse like that where, quote unquote, everything is stored, but there might not be very many people who know exactly where it is and what's in it. Well, that's the other thing. How do they even decide for something? Like, the, like if we're talking about the the nature of being joined in our universe which could be like the greatest national security risk ever right potentially how do you even decide who's a need to know like doesn't that change even like it doesn't mean like every cia director like yeah we'll tell this one there might be some where they're like no like we're not telling and who decides well we that? have evidence that that happened and and you know the presidents at some point quit being read in supposedly right after <laughs> ronald reagan you know, Bill Clinton couldn't get to the information. Obama tried not as hard, but he couldn't get to the information. Trump couldn't get to the information. But Reagan was pretty much read in, and, and, and the Bushes are supposedly some of the people that shepherded that transition from what body politic are we going to inform and not inform. How do but we know that, by the way? There's a lot of um, historical references to Bush and UFOs and historical references to, you know, Bush and... Um, uh, what, Bush and Cheney and uh, and Rumsfeld. <laughs> you know, these guys were like the, the, the suspicious movers and shakers in yeah. Washington before we had suspicious movers and shakers in Washington. These guys were pulling stuff back in the day that, that now would be like, oh my God, that's a scandal and we'd be surprised. But don't be surprised. These guys were play These guys had DC wired and government wired for all kinds of stuff way before we even knew that there was these kind of games being played. 
and and Bush with his you know he was the head of the CIA he he will say well he's gone now but he he he, he would say yeah I know about this stuff but I'm not I'm never going to talk about it and so and this is what I mean we have so one of the things we point out in accidental truth is that there is a history of exactly what we're being told today being told to us in the 50s almost verbatim it's like they couldn't even afford a new screenwriter we have the the head of the air force coming out and saying yes we're witnessing these craft and they're not ours and then in the film we flash forward to luel zondo yes we're witnessing these craft right. and they're not ours we're committed to getting to the bottom of it they said in the 50s then at the senate hearings on ufos they're committed to getting to the bottom of it then back to the 50s general sanford saying um that they're going to uh, start a massive investigation and that they're going to identify whether or not it's a threat. Then fast forward to the Senate hearing where the um, Moultrie, the, the secretary, undersecretary of defense for intelligence says, yes, we're committed to getting to the bottom of it. <laughs> you know, and then this is a 70 year difference. Yeah. Okay. So the idea that there, at one point there was a group like MJ 12, maybe, a group like it, if not that group. MJ twelve, I don't think I'm familiar with that. So the uh, the the story is is that back in the '40s, Eisenhower put together a group, and they called it Majestic Twelve. And the name of these the names of these people are are you know they're historically documented. And there's supposedly these papers that came out describing that they were tasked with taking the whole UFO thing and managing the information <laughs> and sequestering it away. And making managing. sure managing managing which involved burying it yeah. to the point where nobody was accountable so they created this whole organization now people will debate the existence of mj12 it's it, it's a hotly debated subject the papers that came out are people still to this day debate their authenticity but it makes sense that if you're the government in the 40s and 50s and you've got evidence of something that you don't understand that's crashed. You're gonna to put together at the highest level a group of scientists and, and military people to, and, and intelligence people to look at this and manage it and decide how to disperse it to the public, if at all. So if there wasn't an MJ-12, a simple thought experiment would lead you to the point where there must've been somebody. Because you don't have a, a, a craft of unknown origins crash in the desert and then you just don't look into it. Yeah, and it has to be, like, my thought, I think, is in line with most people's thoughts. Like, it has to be something, like, an amalgamation. It has to be something separate. It's not like, oh, the CIA is on this, or like, oh, the NSA is on this. Like, there has to, I'm not saying that there aren't people in those organizations who are, like, read in and a part of it. In fact, mm -hmm. I'll bet that literally is the case. That's, that's pretty much right? describing what I've been able to find out. Right? So, it has to be some sort of, like, group of individuals that are decide to be that are clear to be read in on this and work in tandem together secretly and you know covering up secrets like this that's something that's really hard for me to concept because well here's I what here's i can't what imagine happened. having that information so you got roswell the roswell daily record spills the story general ramey of yes. Earth flying saucer then the next day oh it was a weather balloon Okay, there was there was a group that was responsible for that about face, and and was and was responsible for that whole story changing and being buried and all of whatever was found at Roswell, whether it was alien or whatever, we never saw it. The weather balloon is pretty much debunked completely. So, an organization formed to do that. The first thing they they decided was that well we can't go public with this, mm. so we've got to keep it a secret. So now these guys have free reign in the early days of government to do whatever. They're accountable to nobody except the president. And their job is figure out what to do with this information, figure out what to do with the stuff we've recovered. And their decision was, we can't tell the public for any number of reasons. And now we got to look into this technology. And so it didn't go to the front facing military. It didn't go to the, the halls of Congress. Although a lot of people say some of it ended up in the <laughs> yeah, basement, yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. it went into top secret rooms where they had conversations about, you know, Hey, we found this. Can you look into what that might be? You know, and it could be everything from an intact craft to a piece of technology, to a piece of metal, to a piece of materials, um, any of those things. So over time, with zero accountability, lots of black budget money, and compartmentalization where very few people knew the whole picture. 
So you could be a colonel. Say, let, let's say somebody's sitting on top of this whole thing, okay. and they know the entire story. They're the ones that put this group together. How many of those people are there? Not many. No. Three or four. You're, you're called into these guys' office, and you're handed a piece of, of something, and you're told to take it to Lockheed Martin. So you take it to Lockheed Martin. Now, how many people in that chain know anything about where this stuff came from that, that, that is provable? Nobody. Now, you fast forward 50 years when these guys are all gone, and all that remains is the remnants of these programs and legends about where this stuff came from. Mm. That, is there some kind of repository where all these records are kept? Maybe, but who knows where it is? See, I don't know where the line gets drawn. That's the other problem here. Like, where is it? Where where do do these individuals, whoever they are, figure out that hey, anything at any point, even in the future, like let's say they're saying even three hundred years from now or something like that, anything past this line, we can never talk about. What makes them decide that? To me, this is just where my head goes. Not to go like too far with it, but. It means they're here and they've been here and it's the kind of thing where if we actually had the information shared with the public, people would riot in the streets or kill themselves or whatever they're going to do because it's it's it means it's like the end times are here. That's the only thing I can come up with that makes sense. And then when you start to think that, you're like, well, am I a crazy person too? I, I don't think so, but other people could say that, you know? Well, the idea that, that there's been some kind of presence of a non-human or even alternative human uh, species here on the planet that we don't know about, that's, that's pretty much not hard to dismiss, that they've been here through all of recorded history. In Accidental Truth, we have a, a guy that has come forward in the film for the first time ever admitting that he was running 30 and 40 years ago a secret government program studying this stuff. Who was this guy? Alexander in, in the film. And and he talks about how that these things have been with us for all of recorded history and that flying saucers are absolutely real and that our sensors picked them up from time to time up to a mile wide, he said that he's seen. I think I had him mixed up. Who was the guy who was, because you and I talked about this last night, who was the guy who was basically just a middleman, though? Like well, I think, that, I think that was Alexander. I think that there was a, in, in the time when, when he came in, and Colonel John Alexander, for people who don't know, he's a... He was involved in a lot of esoteric government programs. They studied life after death. They studied non-lethal weapons technology, mind control. He was supposedly involved in um, the what was that program that they did where they were doing mind control experiments on people? MK Ultra. Yeah, he was involved in MK Ultra. He was the guy. He was like the subject of Men Who Stare at Goats. Yeah, they the made movie. that movie, and yeah. he was the Kevin Spacey's character. Supposedly was after him, uh, and he was also. Uh, fictionalized in a book called out there by a, by a new york times writer um but at any rate alexander's military record what we do know and and can prove this guy was ultimately the, the if there was ever a guy that could uh, tell you but he'd have to kill you it might have been john mm. and for years he would say that you know there's no government program studying ufos in, in recent time he's come out and said well that's not exactly true there was and i was actually running one of them and we've been able to find this evidence but he will tell you and he does in the movie maybe for the first time ever that we've been studying these things for a long time and the stuff that that lou elizondo's group found and he he says this too in the film they were they were studying crafting the exact same thing 30 40 years ago and it's the same group that has surfaced through uh ttsa the how put offs, the, uh, the the people like that that came up through Tom DeLong's organization in 2017, these are the same guys that have been involved in these programs going all the way back 30, 40 years. What's that called? To the Stars? To the Stars Academy of yeah. Arts and Sciences. Okay. But um, back to the original question as, as to how this stuff could get sequestered. After a while, nobody knows the whole story. The, di the classified documents have, have been either filed away where nobody knows where they're at or destroyed the P the reason that the information is not getting out if you give something say a, a, just a military officer went to lockheed martin with some material that, that is, is non-earthly or of unknown origin and said you know see what this is what you can do with it 
Well, Lockheed goes, oh, wow, you know, this stuff causes, if you bend it just right, you can have invisibility. Or, or if you do this with it, you can defy radar. Or, you know, th look at this stuff. You can crinkle it up and it folds back out to its original shape. Let's figure that out. Well, now all of a sudden you've got something that a corporation is in possession of that becomes a trade secret that they are not going to share with anybody. And so there's a lot of reason to believe a that a whole bunch of stuff ended up in that category. And it's free from Inf Freedom of Information Act requests. It's free from the prying eyes of the public. But and the government, could, they don't care about that, right? Well, you know, it's kind of like a government industry partnership. Yeah, but like the... See, no longer is the government accountable for this. Once it goes into the private corporation, it goes from a classified program into a corporation. There's no Freedom of Information Act accountability. There's nothing. Okay. All right. And I so now this has been the, the, the whole stuff about crash uh, debris retrievals and analysis and back engineering research. That is all in compartments and stovepipes throughout a huge amount of companies that are accountable not to the public at all. And the fact that these programs even exist has been covered up at the deepest levels because these guys that started all this within government were accountable to nobody in the very beginning. And over time, they've been given so much money and so much black budget money and so much lack of accountability that we have no idea what's going on. And the idea that there's somebody sitting on top of all this right now that, that knows everything about everything UFO related in some secret office in the basement of the Pentagon, I used to think that that was probably true, and now I'm not so sure. Why aren't you, why aren't you sure? There was rumors of something called the Blue Room at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Oh, yes. Please explain this. So supposedly the Blue Room was this room down in the basement of one of these hangars where they stored all the stuff that, like from Roswell and alien technology and even bodies. And it was rumored to be a thing for a long time. Where is that base, Wright-Patterson, Wright it's, it's called? Yeah, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Okay. It's, it's basically pretty much acknowledged as, as being the place where a lot of this stuff ended up. But... um through a variety of evidence and, and stories and documents and everything else. Barry Goldwater, the senator, tried to investigate this, and he called Curtis LeMay, who ran Wright-Patterson at the time, um, and asked him about the Blue Room and got chewed out and said, never, never ask me about this again. <laughs> so a lot of people were like, okay, well, we want to find this film from the Blue Room. So there was a huge, a few years ago, it's been, it's been like 20 years since this happened, but, but it did happen, and it's documented. The extensive Freedom of Information Act requests about the Blue Room and the film. The existence of this film was denied across the board. But finally, somebody asked the right questions and got it to the right department within the Air Force who returned a Freedom of Information Act request that documented that there was a film of the Blue Room at Wright-Patterson Base with a project number a media number assigned to it that was actually shot of the Blue Room at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and was destroyed. Now, if that film was truly destroyed, that's an example of the fact that these guys have no problem just absolutely destroying evidence. If it was supposedly destroyed and it's sitting in a room somewhere and it was never destroyed, that's a different story. But there seems to be a propensity and a willingness by, by the government and the military uh, there's plenty of public records of the military going into a place where something happened and just destroying the evidence. And if they've well, destroyed, yeah. if they've destroyed the evidence of these craft and, and these interactions, I used to think that that would that's impossible. They couldn't have done that. Who would do that? But I, I kind of like, well, you know, maybe they maybe they have in some cases. Yeah, I. Sometimes I wonder if it's like they're burning the test files. Saying, oh, look at us burning all this shit. I guess it's all gone. Yeah. And it's really somewhere else. Like, it fascinates me. You, you I cut... hope that's the case. I really do. I, I do too, but it's still like a little sinister, you know? It's cause... very sinister. This whole thing is sinister. Yes. I mean, it's like, it's, it's the, when I first got into doing stuff in the UFO field, it was because I was hired to video, because I own a production company, I was hired to go in and, and shoot and live stream a UFO conference back in 2007. Oh, that's how you got into it. So I got into the UFO thing. No shit. Legitimately, yeah. I mean, I've always uh, and had an interest. Had you, Okay, so I, this is something you had at least thought about. Yeah, about. you know, I read the magazines. I watched yeah. the shows. I read Eric Von Donneken's yeah. epic uh, ancient astronauts. You know, that was, uh, 
that was the movie that broke the ice for everything. It's still to this day one of the best-selling books of all time and one of the biggest movies. But um, uh, Chariots of the Gods. Mm. But yeah, I got hired to do this thing, and I started watching these people parading around. It's where I interviewed Edgar Mitchell for the first time. It's where I interviewed John Alexander for the first time, Nick Pope for the first time. This is around 20, 2007. And I just it, I got the bug. I'm like, wait a minute. This is the biggest falsehood, the biggest deception being perpetrated on humanity ever. And, you know, as a journalist and as a, as a video person and somebody that, that likes to dig for answers, I was hooked. And I've been investigating this for years, ever since. And I've been interviewing people. I have drawers of hard drives, probably well over 150 hard drives. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to cut you off right there. I'm going to tell you the same thing I told James Fox, and I'm working on him about this all the time. But for you guys who have been doing this for a while and have sat on camera with all these brilliant people for so many years, again, you make a documentary, you got to cut it to 90 to 120 minutes, something like that. All this stuff stays on the cutting floor. And you guys got to do the PBS frontline treatment where when they do these docs, they then have a separate channel where they post the raw interviews with all the people. You guys got to do that. Well, because I, I, the I've done that. you got to have in there is crazy. So when I made the, uh, I made something called the Disclosure Dialogues back in 2010, and it won all the awards at the time. It was, uh, it was basically there was dialogues on disclosure with a feature movie called It Could Happen Tomorrow, mm. and then the it was a five disc set, and the other five discs on the set of the set, the other four discs were all the full length interviews with the people. All right, we need this from everything you've done since then. We got to make a YouTube channel strictly for it. Well, there there's Accidental Truth, the, the new documentary. Yes that has literally 40 hours of interviews behind what is yes, ultimately an 89-minute exactly. film. So there's the, the website um, inside of MUFON Television uh, called AT Insider, Accidental Truth Insider, where all of that stuff is being published. Okay. So like Congressman Tim Burchett is in Accidental Truth saying some really cool stuff. But there's an inter the interview with him was over an hour, and I went to his office and I set up multiple cameras. Something that nobody's seen yet because I haven't put it out is – me sitting in his office for the first part of the interview, lining him out on everything we know from the Roswell incident all the way up until now. <laughs> I'm sitting in a sitting congressperson's office with multiple cameras telling him the whole UFO story that nobody's ever done that. And, and so that's going to be one of the behind the scenes things that people can access. What, co what was his involvement again? Like what committee is he on? You know, what happened with Tim? He's a, uh, um, He's always been kind of into the topic. You know, there's a lot of people in government, we think that we have some kind of separation from them, but they're people just like yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and he's always been interested he's in that. He's not that high. He's a congressman. He, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, and he's a house, <laughs> he's a representative, which yeah. is, you know, he'll tell you in his office is like, yeah, I'm low man on a totem pole. Right. Here. But um, he's a really good guy, down to earth. Um, he's like a big God guy too, right? Yeah, yeah, he's he's, he's very religious. Yeah, he, you know, he. One of the talks that we had, the, my conversation with Tim Burchett, was that, the you know, he's one of those Christian fundamentalists who does not believe that the idea of life in outer space and even aliens visiting the Earth interferes with their belief system. A lot of them do believe that and will staunchly deny it for that sake. But Tim's pretty open minded about that. But what happened is one day he was just crossing the street and he got hit up by TMZ and it was the, the, the UFO things were big uh, in the news. And Tim made a comment like, yeah, it's just a big cover up. More people believe in aliens than believe in Congress. And he walked <laughs> off <laughs> and all of a sudden that was it for Tim. He was now the UFO Congress guy. Uh, and so if you go to his website, you could buy the t-shirt. You know, <laughs> it's pretty funny. But um, that's how that, it was totally just happen chance. Wow. The happenstance that he got uh, kind of thrust into the mainstream talking about this stuff. But he understands. And, uh, and I've talked to three months ago, I had lunch with Andre Carson, the senator, the, the yes. representative that ran that hearing. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. How'd Mike. you get hooked up with him? Well, uh, I work with MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. We're the oldest and largest organization studying the topic. We have lobbyists in Washington, D.C. What, yeah, what a lot of people don't know is that we've been behind the scenes in D.C., including some work by Dave McDonald, the, the director, Jessica Taco, who owns the uh, lobbying firm A10 and Associates that work for us. We've been in D.C. for about two years now, softening everybody up over this disclosure thing. 
And while there's a lot of people out there mm-hmm. talking about it, like, oh, yes, I've been in Washington, D.C. doing this, this, and this, we've been there. And, and we have the proof of it. The hearing that they did with Andre Carson and Mike Gillibrand, or I'm sorry, Mike Gallagher, we were instrumental in getting those hearings done. We're the ones who talked Andre Carson into having those hearings in the first place. That was us. And so the reason I was having lunch with Andre Carson is because I was introduced to him by the lobbying firm and a bunch of people from MUFON went up to D.C. and we met with a lot of sitting congressmen. And so I actually sat down with Andre, sat right next to him for over an hour, and I laid it out for him too. And I told him about the movie because he's in the movie and he's basically portrayed as one of those people who's towing the line for yes. the new story. Yes. And so I kind of had to break that to him. I'm like, well, you know, you're in the film and and, and we're pointing out that you're supporting the new <laughs> You're not <narrative>. great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he went home and watched it and... um. And there was, there's really been no blowback from anybody in the film, even though a lot of them uh, are getting kind of caught <laughs> yeah, saying yeah, stuff yeah. that they shouldn't say. What did he um, say, you know, without revealing confidences or things like that off the record stuff? Like, what was your, what was your take sitting with him for an hour and, and hearing him talk about the subject matter? Did it feel like Gubnit Man or did it feel like... No, you He's know, I, I don't even have to have a take because the conversations are that frank. Um, most of these guys understand, guys and girls, got to count Kirsten Gillibrand, the work that she's doing. They they have an official stance that they have to take, but they they know and will freely admit that they know they're being lied to. They know the government is, even the front-facing oh, people no at shit. the Pentagon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but they know it, and they're mad yeah. about it. Mm-hmm. They they feel the same way about the situation that we feel about it. Now, the complexities that are involved, like if you're on the Senate Intelligence Committee, and you're, after the hearing, you're back in, behind those closed doors, and then you come out of that meeting, it just suddenly becomes intensely complex. You can be like sitting... Like, like I was sitting with Andre Carson, like me and you are sitting right now. And, and he's like, yeah, it's all, it's all smoke and mirrors. There's things I mm. cannot tell you, uh, b- but we're all being lied to by the government body politic. The story that we're hearing is not the story. You know it. I know it. The people know it. And they know that we know that they know that we know it. Doesn't matter. How much of it is... Just government, though. And, and actually, that's a very bad way of asking the question. I need to elaborate on that so you can understand what I'm getting at here. Yeah, because the whole conversation so far has been about how it's not just government. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, like, when we think of government, sometimes we put it in, like, separate boxes. I mean, so we have, like, government, like, Congress, Senate, executive branch, and then we have government, like, agencies and things right. like that. And, and it this conversation has been like there's a mix of a ton of this and then there's people who are coming forward who now aren't in the government allegedly. Mm-hmm. I get all that. But I'm saying at the core of it, even all the way back in the beginning of this history, which we can talk about how it's very interesting that this kind of started right after World War II, like a lot of the stuff. Right. But it's not all of it. There's, there's been reports throughout human history, but the heaviness of it really started after that. When you're dealing with these people who are guarding these secrets from the Andre Carsons of the world, from the Kristen Gillibrands of the world, the elected high-ranking people in supposedly in our government. I start to then think about, like, for example, some of the other people you covered in your documentary, like a Robert Bigelow, mm-hmm. who is a, and air quotes right here for people not listening, a private citizen. Right. And I start to wonder if any of these people, and this is where the tinfoil hat goes on, are any of these people we see who are private citizens all the way to forget ufology for a second all the way to funding political campaigns and things like that are they really private citizens or are they a part of a game and it's just not written down on a central database somewhere there's probably something to that but you know what really what it really is is that you can't say the government because there's too many aspects to it Mm. now you have your front-facing guys like the elected officials that are brought into congress yeah they you know and They have to respect certain privacies, obviously. They take oaths, and if they're given confidential information, it's just like anybody else that has classified information. You can't reveal it. And this is an honor-bound system, and and we should be very thankful that we have uh, people that that respect those oaths and those duties. So I used to be very militantly 
angry. When I started this doc, I was like that. I was like, how dare you keep this? Mm. This, this affects humanity. This affects my ability to live my life. You know something, like, I'm, like Lou and I sitting, just like you and I are sitting. And in the back of my mind during that whole interview, I'm like, dude, you have the keys to the kingdom and you're not going to tell me and we're supposed to be okay with that. <laughs> and, and back then I was like, I'm not okay with that. But over time and really understanding this, I'm a little more okay with it. I still think it sucks. I still think that if you have information that could vitally change the course of humanity, uh, you need to take a really hard look at why you're keeping that from the planet. But I do see both sides of it now a lot more than I did. But back to your question, yes, yeah. we have the front-facing government, the elected officials. Then we have the body politic, the people that are there, the career people that have been there forever. Um, and then we have the clandestine groups. And then below that, we have the black operations that really, over time, they're accountable to nobody. And so the reason the military wasn't officially studying this, even though they were, but, but only in very compartmentalized avenues, is because there was a whole policy to put the ridicule factor into the front-facing rank and file yeah. of the military so that they didn't look at it. But the idea that they were never looking at it and it wasn't being studied by anybody ever is, is ludicrous. And that's what Accidental Truth is about. It's about, they rolled out this new narrative that said Project Blue Book ended, nothing happened until the program started in 2004. And for people who aren't familiar, who didn't see the James Fox podcast, can you just explain very quickly what Project Blue Book was? Sure. So Project Blue Book was uh, back in the 50s. There was a huge flap about UFOs. It was bigger than it is now in popular culture. Mm -hmm. And so the government did a couple of things to try to appease the public. And one of them was, we're going to do Project Blue Book. We're going to go and officially investigate this. Um, how that turned out was that it really was not a real honest investigation into UFOs. It's a cover-up. It was a cover-up. Yeah. yeah, it was basically the kind of a dog and pony show. And in Accidental Truth, we actually uncovered that there was a whole other um, parallel group that was studying these, the, these phenomena secretly while Project Blue Book was paraded in front of the public. So now enter 2017, 18, when we get these stories that come out, the resurgence of UFOs in common and military culture, that Project Blue Book ended with this official closing and that the government had no involvement in UFO studies until they picked up the, the what was eventually the ATIP program. And the film is really all about uncovering that that is completely untrue and showing a lot of what was going on, what they discovered, what they were studying, and what came out of these missing years. Because the what we call the new narrative that says there was this big gap where government wasn't studying this at all, unfortunately, they're, they're whitewashing that past because they mm. want to be able to... The information is going to come to the surface, but how they got it and how they kept it a secret and how they manipulated it and who's been in control, that's this empty period between the 50s and, and, the, uh, and the 90s and the 2000s where they can't talk about it. They've got, they've got culpability they have to relieve themselves of. They've got the accountability that they're not going to take because terrible things were done to keep very important information away from the public. So if you are, quote unquote, the government, how are you going to get this information out? Because sooner or later, Elon Musk is going to land on Mars and he's going to know that there's something there. And private commercial space is going to come out and they're going to find something. A spaceship sooner or later is going to land. Some, some evidence that is irrefutable is going to come forward sooner than later in, in our day of technology. You don't think those people are in on it? They got to be read in. So I think they're read into a point. I think like, like I actually have this on good authority. I called Elon out about his thing about not saying aliens. I went on YouTube and, and did a video. Thousands of people watched Not it. saying aliens? Yeah. It, when, when Elon was at, um, uh, he, was in, he was in Boca, Texas, where his Starlink or the Starship base is. And it was one of the times when he was revealing the prototype for the, yeah. the big Starship. Well, he, he came out during that speech and he says, you know, I, aliens, I don't know. I've never seen any evidence of aliens, he <laughs> oh, says, yeah. and I should know. Well, the next day yes. I made a YouTube video and I said, Elon, I don't know why you're saying this stuff. Why don't you talk to Robert Bigelow? I got a proposition for you. 
and I, and I made it a big joke because at the time my studio was right across the street from SpaceX in Hawthorne. And I actually had a spaceship set in my studio where Kendrick Lamar came and shot his video with George Clinton. <laughs> and so I'm like, Eli, come on, man, we're buddies. You got a spaceship in Hawthorne, California? I have a spaceship in Hawthorne, <laughs> California. I mean, it makes us kindred spirits. And, it was, and I made a joke out of it, but I said, look, private briefing. I will send some of the best experts in the world from MUFON and from the UFO community, and we just need a half hour of your time. Yeah, that, that's not... Elon is... He's got contracts up and down with the government. That to me, like he knows, he knows. Well, what see, it that's is. that's what I was getting to. Yeah, is um, you know, we made that offer to him, and I know for a fact that because we put the media link to move on, it they got overwhelmed with people saying, "Why don't you do it?" Elon's thing, I believe, I can't say for sure, but I've also talked to people that that run video production inside his organization. He might be an alien. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, and, and, and the thing is, is he's, he's got his interest in space and he's been told by the people that, that, that are making sure that he gets to continue having an interest in space, yes. stay away from the alien thing. Just don't, don't, don't go so there. Why, but here's a question. Why does he stay away? But Robert Bigelow goes right in. Well, look what happened to Robert Bigelow when he did. What happened to Robert Bigelow when he did? <laughs> okay. They will deny that there's any connection because I personally asked people that would know if this was, if I was right. But when Robert Bigelow went on 60 Minutes and said there's definitely aliens, within a few months, Bigelow Aerospace imploded, supposedly because of COVID. His technology for these space habitats got sequestered off and, and cannibalized by a bunch of other companies, just took it. And NASA quit, did, stiffed him for millions of dollars in owed contracts. He had to sue them to get his money. And for you had we had mentioned Bigelow earlier, but for full context for people who aren't totally aware, who what was his claim to fame and and who is he and how long has he been around? So Robert Bigelow is a billionaire from Nevada. He made his money building like uh, residential hotels for people. Um, that that's where he, that's where he made his money, like budget suites, places where working people could have a place to stay for an extended period. He made a lot of money, uh, and he always had an interest in the paranormal. At one point, he bought Skinwalker Ranch um, and formed the National Institute for Discovery Sciences, where basically he brought in that this was formed around him meeting and getting to know all a bunch of these guys that had been involved in some of these programs that we uncover in Accidental Truth, Hal Putoff and guys like Eric Davis and, and some of the other people that were involved in this, Colonel John Alexander, mm, yeah. <laughs> who, who was running these secret government programs studying UFOs. In Accidental Truth, he reveals that he was actually with Robert Bigelow the day he bought Skinwalker Ranch, and he went and spent the first night alone up on the Mesa. Um, so all of these military spooky guys got with Robert Bigelow, and they formed this institute. And then right after he bought Skinwalker Ranch, here comes the Defense Intelligence Agency with a contract, and that was the beginning of ATIP. So, which was OSOP at the time. And I, I don't remember exactly what that stands for. Yeah, what was the exact... So, bi basically, what Bigelow purchased and what he was building created what became a government agency called ATIP. Well, it wasn't really... It was kind of like ATIP itself... Well, I'll go into that after after I sure. tell the okay. story. Because people don't really understand the, the taxonomy of how this all works. Um, but... Robert Bigelow formed the National Institute of Discovery Science with all of these guys that had government ties and backgrounds, and they, they were studying Skinwalker Ranch and, and other things. And that's when the, the DIA found out about what was going on, and they went there, and they were intrigued, and so they decided to throw some money at it. Um, but these all these guys are connected and talking all along. Yes. Well. It's not like suddenly something this Yeah, it didn't fall from the sky. <laughs> right. So when, when the DIA got involved, the uh, the program was was called OSOP, and the contract for that was um, uh, given to Robert Bigelow. And some of the stuff that he was supposed to study was a weird phenomenon at Skinwalker Ranch. But there were also things in the contract about studying materials, studying technology, studying human biological interfaces, and all kinds of different technologies that we don't have, um, all under one umbrella. And so that was the beginning of this program that came out with Lou Elizondo. And when was that approximately? Back in the 2000s, okay. early 2000s. Because that's where I get a little lost because I'm like, 
it seems like it was born organically out of this quote unquote private citizen just investing in this stuff. Well, and it was with born... the connotation that then the government didn't already have something like that. You know what I mean? Right. Like, that's a little sketch to me. Well, see, this is all a part of coming up with a logical way to bubble this information to the public without having to admit where it came from. Mm. Okay, so what we're seeing here is that all of these guys that were in these government programs, mid-level, partially read in, they know enough to know that there's been crash debris. They know enough to know that there's different technologies that have been reverse engineered, but they don't know everything. And, and they're not even read in. But they've been they've been read in enough to the point where they they know uh, enough to know what's going on with materials with debris. They know about some of the programs. Also, guys, until tomorrow, July fourth, you can get Accidental Truth on Apple for just two ninety nine instead of four ninety nine. So hit the link in the description below and go check it out. Um, and then when they found Robert Bigelow, that was you know he was interested in this stuff and he had money. And so that gave them another way to fund this stuff. Because a lot of the work that like Hal put off and even John Alexander did back in the day was what they call ad hoc programs, which means that they weren't really official government programs, but they were being run by a bunch of people with all of the resources and access mm. because they were in the government. And it's very common. And they, they call them ad hoc programs. And the reason they're ad hoc is because it enables them to not be accountable to Freedom of Information Act requests. In other words, if you have an official government program that's going to study something, well, then that becomes part of an official record that may have to be revealed. But if you have an oh. ad hoc program where it's like, you know, hey, I got this guy from the CIA, we all have clearances, and we're all talking, and it's like, hey, you know, what's this piece of technology? But nobody knows nothing. We think it's anti-gravity. We're going to yeah. have to look into that. And so they all get together, and they decide that's what they're going to do. But it's not under an official auspice of a government program that's officially budgeted, blah, 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 blah. It's still being run with all the resources and, and abilities of people with high clearances. But it's an ad hoc program. Therefore, it's not accountable ever. And so put off and, and Alexander and all of these different people back in the day were running a lot of these programs, some of them under official auspices, but also some of them as ad hoc programs. And... When they got with uh, Robert Bigelow, obviously being with running ad hoc programs means you don't have government money. And so Robert Bigelow was a breath of fresh air to these guys because he did have money, lots of it. And so when they formed the National Institute of Discovery Sciences, they were able to fund a lot of this research that these guys had been tr researching all along, but do it in, in, through a civilian mechanism. And what's the, like, everyone always tosses around the Pentagon or stuff like that because, you know, that's where we look for, like, our defense and things and things. But, like, how much of this is, like, just people guessing, like, oh, this shit happens in the Pentagon versus, like, that's just an assumption and really it – we don't know where this is. We don't – you know, wh where was the Blue Room again? Ohio? Wright-Patterson Air Force Yeah, yeah. Base. So yeah. like – and that's probably a front for something. Like we do we even really know or have any definitive idea of where they actually do this stuff? Like I'll believe it if they're like, oh, Lou Elizondo had a desk that was in the Pentagon. Yeah, I'll believe that. He could have had a fucking computer like this at the desk and right. just, you know, showed up to work nine to five. You know what I mean? Like where they're actually doing that's this stuff. Like people talk about Area 51. That means that's probably not where it is now. You know, like do we have any clues or are we just totally like throwing darts against the wall on that? There's a certain amount of evidence where different programs are happening. Um, Eric Weinstein gives some really great interviews where he talks about that stuff. Um, but Is he a fed? Uh, well, aren't they all right? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like Eric. I mean, I the just, thing uh, is, is once, you're, I, once you're read into to something, then you are part of the intelligence. And, mm. you know, you might not be a, a Fed per se, but once they pull you into that room and they reveal information to you and you agree not to share it, you become part of that system for better or for worse. Yeah, which actually, in all fairness to the people who find themselves in that situation, is not... I don't have a problem with that. Like, right. if, no, like if I don't either. You're brought into the room and you're like, oh, by the way, you just signed a non-disclosure. You can't say shit about this. Well, guess what? They can't say shit about it. Like right. people, that's like kind of the ivory tower part of things like these arguments when we talk about ufology and stuff. Like I understand it's a huge secret. It's a whole meaning of life thing and people want to know. But you have to be 
Like, I think we run with the, like, people don't joke like I do about, like, the Fed thing. You know, right. like, I get it. But other people are like, how dare they? These lizard people are keeping all these fucking secrets from it. It's like, you have to keep some level of, like, people understanding that people don't have this in their control. These are, you know, it's this, you keep on using the phrase, read in. It's some guy who read in another guy who read in another guy who read in another guy. And maybe they didn't even want to know about it. Right. But now they're tasked with like, they got to sit there and I'm Lou Elizondo sitting across from Ron James. And I know that there's like 10 things popping in my head right now that my whole family is going to get murked if I say it. Right. And and that's a real thing. And yes. in, in, in Accidental Truth, you know, I, I asked Lou about that and he actually says, yeah, this is very uncomfortable. I do not want to be in the position I'm in. And if anybody could replace me, I'd do it. And I actually believe that of him personally. Um, but I also believe that he is still working. Um, once you are in that deep in the intelligence community, you don't retire. Yeah, you're you're done. I mean, you are you are that for life. And so, he's and he did not deny it to me when I interviewed him. I said, Lou, you know, people think that you're part of an organized <laughs> rollout of this information, and that you're just basically accomplishing <laughs> your mission right now. And he just sat back and smiled. You know, and it's like, of course, and it would be silly to think different. Um, but does that make Lou a bad guy? No. No, that's uh, and that's, you know, that's the, point. the whole point. Yes. Yeah. And and that's I, I think you having that implicit and I would even say based on how you're asking the questions, like explicit understanding is important because yeah. you're not the world is unfortunately far too complex to just be able to say, fuck it, yeah, we'll show you. Like like even use one that's a one off situation. Like look at the JFK thing. They still it's sixty years later. They still haven't released shit about that, obviously, mm -hmm. right? If there were one or two people who worked somewhere in the government who had knowledge of it happening, think of all the hundreds of thousands of people who work in the government who had no idea any of that was going down. If the public got a hold in a mob of that evidence, even today, 60 years later, a lot of these people are dead. Most of them are dead. I don't think they could handle it. Because the risk would be that they'd all descend upon Washington, D.C. and say, we're run by a bunch of murderers. And then suddenly the, the grip of democracy and, and having a place where you elect people to go, now suddenly like it's fragile and it could be ripped. So like, do I want to know the, the actual evidence and like for sure be able to say, yes, Carlos Marcello and Sam Giancana and the whole crew worked with so-and-so, this one guy at the government and they whacked the president or something like that. And here's the, here's the stone cold evidence. And by the way, there were three shooters or something like that. Yes. I'd love to know that selfishly, but I have accepted the fact I'm probably never going to know that. And I understand why. I hate it, but I understand why. And I think more people have to have, this is just my opinion, but I think more people have to have that understanding. So to talk to someone who's making documentaries on something like this and, and goes into it getting that and not, you know, pounding the table, just pissed off about it, you know, I, I think that's valuable because it gives you, it gives you going into these projects a dose of reality. You know, and that's that's an important thing because sometimes we run with stories and spheres like this and they go too far. And what they do is then, you know, when people exaggerate things and stuff, it then affects everyone else in the space. And that that the lowest common denominator becomes the definition and things like this get laughed off. That's what that's how it happens, you know. And I wanted to avoid that with my movie. Yeah. It's like people are like, look, Accidental Truth is not like an episode of Ancient Aliens. It's not meant to be <laughs> entertaining. It's yeah. not meant to be like sensationalized. Accidental Truth is a historical document. It is 89 minutes that if you know absolutely nothing about UFOs, yes. you, will, you will be brought up to speed at least enough to understand that there's validity to this. There's nothing in it that doesn't have solid evidence behind it. And as Ralph Blumenthal said, I don't, can't remember if I used it in the movie or not, but he says, you know, what we can prove is compelling enough. We don't need to make stuff up. We don't need to reach mm. for things that we cannot show evidence for. So this whole film brings us right up to the current day, going all the way back to the 40s, and even when we go back and revisit Roswell, which I hated to do, I didn't want to make a film that's a history lesson. And there's people out there that say, well, we knew all this stuff before. And I will be the first to admit, yes, there is stuff in this film that most people already know, especially if you're in the UFO community. But once you get into the last three quarters of the film, the last two thirds of the film, there's a lot of bombshells, yes. literal bombshells. And uh, 
it I didn't make it to be like like you know any other film. It it is literally a, a, a snapshot in time with the best evidence ever to make the case. It was as if I was an attorney presenting the case for ufology, government cover ups, yeah. and materials and crash debris to a jury. And I got some of the most prevalent people in the field to all but admit that it's all true. The under the Chris Mellon, the former Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, you know, he put out that story when 2017 first came out. He says, yeah. "Well, the government's not studying UFOs at all." Now, I interviewed him right after that, and that Zoom interview that you see in the thing is, yeah, it's a Zoom interview. It doesn't look that good, but I, I did that. Interview. Everyone else was pretty much in person, though. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I I did that interview and I said Chris I couldn't put the whole question and answer in because I tried to keep things very concise through the film, but but I said look Chris here's here's the problem, you just went up and you put this big thing in the Washington mm -hmm. Washington newspaper. I think it was New York post. Times for him, right? You no, know, it was the Washington something. The Times or the Post, one of the two, for Mellon for okay. his first story. But um. He, uh, he, and I said, look, here, here's the thing. You just said that the government has not been studying UFOs. You're towing the line that, that when this program that just came out, the ATIP program, that that's the beginning since Blue Book. But we know that's not true. I'm, I'm with MUFON. We know that that's not true. We have plenty of evidence that there's been tons of government programs. And if you were the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, either A, you know and you're not telling, which makes you part of the cover-up, or B, you weren't read in. And right there in the interview, right there in the film Accidental Truth, he says, yeah, you know, there's a, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> and, 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 you and, got me. <laughs> and then he goes on to explain, he says, there's different levels of, of secret access programs. I had access to most of them, but there's also stuff at the Department of Energy, which is very telling because if you look into what the Department of Energy covers deals with, you know, Bill Richardson ran the Department of Energy, and Bill Richardson comes out talking about how Roswell was a real thing. Wait, that's not... Governor Bill Richardson from... He is the governor from New Mexico. He was, yeah. And and then he got the Department of Energy. He was digging into Roswell, and all of a sudden, he's head of the Department of Energy. And my, we know my that... Ma my man was... Uh, I just got to say this. My man was in Epstein's Black Book. He was a feature in that black book that's that's why he's laying low my I tried to get him for the movie right now yeah yeah so but anyway bill richardson um was looking into it and and made some very controversial statements but my point okay so chris mellon acknowledges there's stuff in the department of energy that the defense department can't get to and there's stuff in other go government organizations secret programs that the defense department doesn't have access to and then he goes on to say and so is it possible that there was some group somewhere that had some crash debris or something? That's always possible. And I just, in the interview, I just stop it right there in the film. It's like, excuse me, what did you just say? <laughs> and, and so that, yeah, and that is why the film's called Accidental Truth, because as far as I'm concerned, that was an accidental truth. There's going to be people out there that say, well, he didn't just admit anything. I'm like, are you serious? Are you watching his face? Are you listening to his words? You know, I, I backed him into the corner about making these public statements in a friendly way. And, yeah, yeah. And, and, he, and he tackled the answer. And the way he tackled the answer was to literally admit that, yeah, there's probably people studying crash debris and I, and I couldn't get to it. In their defense on any admissions like that, though, they're still, they're admitting that the idea of things exists, or, which is big. Mm-hmm. But they're still not saying, and it's right here with these guys working on it, and here's how long they've been doing it, and here's what they found. So we're still left with the whole abstract idea of, well, what does that mean then? What do they right. have? And that's the and that's the hard thing. Again, you well, see go. that that's in, in accidental truth. We go into that too. You know, where did night and all come from? Where did transparent no, aluminum come from? Yeah, there there is a whole list of um, material. There was there was a guy named Anthony Brugalia. And he's a lot of people don't like him in the UFO community. For two years, he was petitioning the Department of Defense and the Defense Intelligence Agency for any information in their possession with regards to residue, shot off flotsam, debris, materials recovered from UFOs by members of the US government and being studied at Bigelow Aerospace. Mm. This is in the film. And the government came back after two years of threatening blah, 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 with answers responsive to your request. It was 300 and something pages of reports about materials that 
nobody knew existed. Okay. And there was a big blow up. All, all of the people that are protecting the new narrative, and um, you guys know who you are. Um, <laughs> they came out there. and they trashed this guy. They, they, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And the, the thing that they, they didn't address was that these are official government documents coming from the Defense Intelligence Agency admitting that there's UFO materials being studied at Bigelow Aerospace in Las Vegas, among other places. This was an admission. And then some people said, well, Freedom of Information Act responses aren't exact. And it's like, <laughs> yes, they are. The, yeah. the, the, the people that release FOIAs make a habit of wordsmithing. Oh, I'm sorry, you said and instead of, uh, instead of including. So you didn't get the answer you sought. Very specifically worded request, very specifically responsive answers. Um, and so we have seven or eight different materials that were released and that has, being studied and the thing that all these materials had in common is that most of the reports were talking about what the materials might do, how they might be applied, and nothing about, basically, we didn't make them, we don't know. They don't come out directly and say that. But have you ever, can you conceive of a corporation spending billions of dollars to come up with a material and they don't know what they're going to do with it? No. Okay. Unl unless... Unless there were some dark funding saying, we just need you to come up with something. Well, so like metallic glass was one of these materials. Remember back in Star Trek, right? Transparent aluminum. And it was a big thing. What people don't know is that they actually had transparent aluminum at the time. It was patented by Raytheon a few years back. And it, the origin of where Raytheon got the patents that it's it's very very murky. Same thing with night and all the shape shifting alloy that we see now in in industry. We traced its origins back to right through where the they say it came from, all the way back to a private corporation that was studying yeah. materials under a Wright Patterson contract around the time of Roswell. Um, and, and we have the stories of the Roswell memory metal that you could wrinkle up and it would unfold. Yeah, so, yeah. That's a real thing now. We have metal that does that. And it came out of a laboratory studying Wright-Patterson uh, materials research. And, we're, and this is proven. Then there's other materials that they say came um, that may have a particular tunable resonance that was determined during manufacturing. They say that it may have a tunable resonance determined during manufacturing. Don't they know if they if they manufactured it? Wouldn't they know if it had a tunable resonance that they determined during well, manufacturing? Well, that, that could be. I'm playing devil's advocate. That could be legal cover because that maybe it's. And I have no idea because I don't even know how this shit works. But like maybe. It's because not every time it does, or they ran some tests where it didn't every time, and now they got to say it may. Like I, I don't know if I'd read. Well, the point is that this these reports came out of a Freedom of Information Act request demanding information about debris recovered by from UFOs by members of the Department of Defense. Yeah, and it, and it's saying you know it may have uh, you know a tunable resonance determined during manufacturing. Okay, but. If we're manufacturing it, don't we know if it's going to have a tunable resonance or not? The, the point is, is that the way the reports are worded, we didn't make it. We're trying to figure out what it does. Every one of these five different reports about materials says it may do this. It may do that. It may have possible future implications. Could it be, though, and this is where it can get murky with where does private end and public sector begin, Right or government sector, begin. But have you ever read Annie Jacobson's stuff, some of her books? No, you are telling me about that. At, at oh, I did talk to you about yeah. this yesterday. Okay, but for people out there who who haven't heard of her or, or don't know, I, I talk about this a lot. My, my, my buddy Danny Jones at, at Concrete is reading like every word this woman's ever written, and he's like blown away by it. He's always telling me about it. I've read some of her stuff. It's, it's pretty amazing work. But she writes about... She's written about everything from Operation Paperclip post World War II to mm -hmm. Area 51 sure. to straight up CIA stuff to DARPA stuff. And DARPA is the one that's really interesting because oh, yeah. DARPA is that's the agency that, like, or I don't even know if it's officially like an agency, but that's the government organization that in the mainstream you can bring up to people who like know their way around with stuff and they'll be like, wait, what is that again? And it meaning it's not. It's much more in the shadows more than some of these other places like the CIA and NSA and stuff. And some of the conjecture, I'll call it that, 
that has been reported on that they're able to work on there is basically saying the what I would say has been a public theory for a long time that what they have is always far ahead of what the public has. Well, sure. But the conjecture goes as far as saying, no, it's like 50, 60 years ahead sometimes. That I have more of trouble b- believing. But when we're talking about private organizations like this, that you're talking about some of these reports where it comes out and they say, well, they don't know what they're working on. I wonder if they are basically partnered with DARPA in the sense that like we see a lot of ex-CIA spies in air quotes who work for fucking Raytheon or whatever. Right. It's just a it's it's a numerical thing on a page for them to pay their taxes. It's not like they're not still. It's just a way for the government to be able to make sure they get paid to do the job they want to do for them. So when I look at Raytheon or these other places when it comes to some of these projects, I start to wonder, is it the same thing? And then take it a step farther. If it's not something that in these public reports or the things that get pulled out of FOIA that they write that they understand, is it because it's something that's been developed in highly experimental scientific stuff behind the scenes – via something like a DARPA that like, yeah, the world doesn't have a concept of it, but we have it. Like I always bring up the example when David Fravor, who gives amazing testimony on what he saw from the Nimitz with the, with the Tic Tac and he sure. gives you the radar. It's really compelling stuff. And I, I, I think he's a great witness when I see something like that. And that was in Oh four, I think when he saw it, yeah, I'm like, that feels like that could have been DARPA technology. So when I hear things like the meta materials, my mind does go to that first, not to be like too much of a skeptic, but I'm like, is this stuff where, that they have physically understood and we're just not there yet? Do you ever consider that as a possibility? Well, it's it, you know it's a matter of connecting the dots and doing doing the thought experiment and reading the reports. The if if you've got a Freedom of Information Act request that you have had to threaten to sue the Defense Intelligence Agency for two years before you finally get an answer, and then they finally come back and there's numerous exchanges between this Anthony Borgalia guy and this uh, the guy from the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, it was one person, an information officer. His name was Tominsky, uh, Stephen Tominsky. And and they, they, I have these. They, you know, I can't put everything in the film, but I, I, everything in the film is backed up by pages and pages of reference material. So we have the letters that went back and forth over two years. And there's one letter that says very clearly, just to re, recommit before we present you with this information, you want the material related to material recovered from the Department of Defense from UFOs by and studied at Bigelow Aerospace. Yes. Here's mm. the documents. Now, you could just stop right there and say, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that the government just gave this guy reports that they specifically are admitting are what he asked for. Mm. Information about materials recovered for, by the U.S. Department of Defense from UFOs being studied at Bigelow Aerospace and other places. That's what they gave him. So they give him these reports. Um, so you could just stop right there and say, well, what does that tell you? Well, that tells you that the government is acknowledging that they got this stuff from this, and it took two years and a lot of research to get the material. But then when you look into the actual reports, now, sure, night and all, it's just something that's mainstream. So is transparent aluminum. You know, that's being studied at DARPA as an armor. You mentioned the night and all very quickly earlier. I can't remember if you gave the full context of what that was. That's if you that. Shape, it's, a shape, that? it's a shape-shifting memory-retaining alloy. Um, that basically we use it today in a lot of, th- of things. NASA's making spaceship wheels out of it. It's used in medical devices. Uh, they make stints out of it. It's basically, it's a metal that you can bend it and then just let go of it and it'll bend back to the position it was in originally, which is exactly what's described from Roswell as this material that you yeah. could bundle up and it would come back. Right. And so the origin of nitinol, supposedly, from a naval weapon, a naval research laboratory back in the... 60s or late 50s. Um, in fact, the name Nitinol stands for naval something, something, something. Um, and that's where it came from, right? Just talking in the mic, by yeah. the way. Just so, sure. so, way but, better. Yeah. But, but so not so fast about Nitinol. Nitinol is a titanium alloy. And what we find is that before the Naval Weapons Research Laboratory or whoever says they invented it had it, there was a scientist at a place called Battelle Memorial Institute, which is still a huge contractor for the government, who was who who did some of the very earliest studies on titanium alloys, and because titanium wasn't a big thing, 
until this stuff came out of Battelle. The Battelle research went to the Naval Weapons Research Laboratory that says they invented night and all, but it was, it was created at Battelle. And Battelle at the time had a contract with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to study materials. Mm. And so th that's the thing about the film and, and all this evidence. You start connecting these dots, there, you start running out of different places to go. And then as they go and we talk about the other materials that are, that are mentioned in the reports, may induce invisibility by reflecting or reflecting light. Now, we know that we have technology that we're studying right now that does it. We know DARPA has it, but where did it come from? And where did the idea come from? Mm. So we have these reports that, that are saying not this material induces invisibility. It says it may. And so these are early reports about the preliminary assessments of these materials before they got into DARPA, before they got into private industry. Then we have another one that has the interesting ability to compress electromagnetic energy. Now, they don't know how to do that. They didn't at the time. Dr. Michio Kaku comes on in the film and says, we have ways to create materials that will mimic invisibility. Yes. But we cannot yet do it in the optical frequencies. But in these reports, it talks about material that can do it in the what, optical what is, frequencies. What does that mean when he says that, in the optical frequencies? Basically, the way I got it from his explanation is that, say you've got something, that a material that if you put it under a certain kind of light, uh, could become transparent yes. and induce invisibility. Yeah. Now, that's a spectrum frequency. It's, it's done under artificial conditions. The optical frequency means that I could take this material and I could put it anywhere and it would render whatever invisible in the optical frequencies. So in other words, it would work anywhere. Um, mm. He says we can't do that yet. But these reports talk about materials that may be able to do it. And I've seen stuff that is, is mimicking that, you know, like the invisibility cloak that you see on YouTube. So we're not far, and DARPA's probably already got it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, they but that shit. <laughs> the idea came from somewhere, and the government admitting these reports um, about these, th these materials that may do this, yeah. We're dealing with technology that we have now that probably came from some of this stuff. But the point of all of that is that this guy fought for this information. And when it came out, the Pentagon walked it back immediately saying, oh, no, that's not UFO stuff. Well, then why are you telling us it is? And why can't you, to mm. this minute, why can't you tell us what this material does? And why can't we see a sample of it? You know, I mean, it's just like, it's, it, as, you, as you follow the rabbit hole and you follow the dots that I lay out in the movie, you know, I'm not... I'm not coming to conclusions for the viewers. I'm saying, here's the evidence. It will stand up. You can ask me all day long about where I got this, what it means, where it came from, how legit is it? And I can answer all those questions. There's nothing in the movie that's not coming from factual base. And a lot of it is coming from stuff that came straight from the government in forms of freedom of information requests. Yeah, but to your points from earlier, obviously there's... I want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding that. Obviously there is some of the people you're talking to are giving some sort of factual cover, like with some sort of like, ref, uh, what's the word? Not reflecting. Why can't I think of that word? This always happens. Something about listening to these headphones and hearing yourself back. Sometimes you can't think of the right word. That's the one deflection. thing. Deflection. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, the, Chris deflection. Mellon says that to me. He says, May, no, it's, not, it's not in the film, but right after that he said, and you know, maybe this is a deflection, yeah. but there are people in Congress that are allowed to answer this question. And I'm like, well, Chris, you're talking about the gang of eight, the, the eight yeah. members of Congress that are supposed to be able to get to everything. But if you can't get to everything, how can they get to everything? And you're a melon. Yeah, You're but a plus, member of the Mellon family. Yeah, and the and the former Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence for yeah. under two administrations. Okay, you know, the, and and so to be able to, not, I'm not going to say to be able to back him into a corner, but be able to ask him an extremely pointed question that I might mention he will not answer now to anyone, um, and get him to give me a good answer. It was because I was working with History Channel at the time to help them promote that show, Unidentified where the TTSA guys all came came up and had a whole show. I don't think I saw that. Yeah, yeah it was Lou, Lou and Chris and everybody kind of going hmm. back and retracing to some of the steps. That's where the pilots all came out. But I was working with History Channel, plus, you know, I, I was with MUFON, and that's how I got that interview, is the people at A&E kind of told Chris, yeah, it's okay, talk to them. And, and you know, that was when I was, ah. yeah. <laughs> that's when I was going in. Um, 
When I think you, I just messed up the headphones. No, you're good. I'm, I'm looking at you. You look great. But w- when you look at organizations like something like MUFON, which is like a community, and then you look at things like History Channel, which is mm-hmm. like media, obviously some of the very people who are being interviewed by these places, by someone like you, who's a representative right. of both, or other people on these shows, like you just mentioned, obviously it includes the Lou Elizondos, the Chris Mellons, the government guys who... They can say some things. They can't say some other things. They may be told to say some things on purpose for a specific reason. Like that's obviously some sort of deflection for the government. But like how much do you feel the paranoia of being surrounded by people who are, for lack of a better way of putting it, plants to make sure that places like MUFON don't get to information that they don't want them having? Like is that a constant like – Every conversation you get into, like, oh, maybe this guy works for him or something like that. Or are you more just kind of resigned to the fact that that exists and it just is what it is? I'm resigned to the fact that it exists, which makes me constantly thinking about how to get one step ahead of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. honestly, it's like that. that's what I did with this movie. It's like every piece of information in this film, I got it fair and square. Yes. I got it out of these guys. I didn't have to say, well, you could tell me, but I won't tell anybody. I never made what I call the devil's deal. And the devil's deal in ufology is when you get called in by somebody in the know and they say, and you're a UFO investigator and you're all about getting the truth to the public, but all of a sudden you're in this room and they tell you something that, and and you agree that you're going to keep it. You just sold your public integrity to the topic for personal information that you personally crave. And once you make that deal, and there's a lot of you out there that have done it, and you know who you are, and I know who you are, um, (laughs) there's a lot of them out there that have done it. Now they're towing the new line. They're towing the new narration. They're telling the new story, which is basically we're whitewashing this last 50 years, and the information that we came up with over the last 50 years, we're using these new ways to, to introduce it to the public. So that's a lot of what the Bigelow Aerospace Project was all about was how do we take this black stuff, black ops stuff, and and top, top secret discoveries and, and technology and data, and how do we get it into the public in a way that we can just pretend all that stuff didn't happen? And so, oh, yeah, let's study materials at Bigelow Aerospace. They probably never even had the materials. There's a, that's a whole debate in itself, because when this story came out... What, what makes you say they never had it? Well, they, they, because they want you to believe they never had it. In, in again, in accidental truth, we point out that um, that for a long time it was being reported and acknowledged that there were materials being studied at Bigelow Aerospace. There were news stories done about it. There were newspaper articles done about it. Um, then all of a sudden, after this big drop of the Freedom of Information Act about the materials, it's an about face. A whole group of people come together and say, "Oh, wait a minute." We said that there were facilities prepared to study materials at Bigelow Aerospace, but we never said he got them. And you see in the film, you see Ralph Blumenthal doing that, and you see George Knapp doing it, um, where George says, did you ever have, the New York Times reported that you prepared your facilities to study materials. Did you ever have them? And, And Bigelow's like, no, I never saw anything. And people have to wait to see what happens next. But the point is, when this stuff dropped from the from the FOIA requests. All of these new narrative backing people discredited it. The Pentagon discredited it. And then there was this big movement to get rid of any implications that Bigelow was involved in studying materials. And it, it uh, my personal opinion, and I can't prove it, but I think it makes a strong case, is that after the alien 60 minutes flap, <laughs> Robert Bigelow didn't want anything to do with more classified potentially sensitive information getting out with his name on it. And so there was an effort to walk the whole thing back about what happened at, at Bigelow. But we know that the the files for OSOP and ATIP are there at the Bigelow Aerospace plant, the photos, the pictures, the documentation. It's all still there, or at least it was when I made the movie. Um, so his involvement in this has, and, and his desire to at least drop significant hints to the public might have cost him a lot. You know, now he's doing life after death. He's <laughs> yeah. not even doing the UFO thing. Yeah. And this was after the the drop of the uh, the material study information. Or that could be a public front. I, I mean, don't, yeah. Yeah, well, I, my, my personal opinion is that, uh, you know, he said some things that he shouldn't have said. And 
and he paid a price for it. It's also calculated that I can't like prove he, that. But yeah, I, I do yeah. Believe like it. he went on sixty minutes. He planned out doing it. It wasn't like you know TMZ caught him outside his house and he said something. Right. You know it was. I, I, I think I, I think he I planned it, but I'm not convinced that he had permission from the ground all the way up. I don't think that his handlers had said, "Hey, go on some minutes and say there's aliens." And, you know, again, another thing we point out in the film is that at the time he did that, this was months before the New York Times article broke and and the admission about a tip came out. Nobody knew who Bigelow was at the time. Mm. He went on 60 Minutes and said, "Yes, there's aliens." But a couple months later, I can't remember the exact time frame. But very shortly afterwards, when the A-tip story broke and Elizondo and all this and it, and it exploded into the mainstream, then all of a sudden, if you went back and cross-referenced what he said on 60 Minutes, and now you had this new information about who he actually was and what he was actually doing, it changed the entire landscape. And, and that escaped most people. It also doesn't help that he looks like a Spider-Man villain. <laughs> Something about like the close cut stash and everything, like the perfectly coiffed hair. I don't know. Something about that. Again, like that's where I get my red lights go up and I go, okay, what's the real angle here? I mean, maybe. I, I could see what you just said could absolutely uh, be true. Well, look, okay, I, I'm starting to understand your thought process. Okay, so you have the 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 evidence chain, everything that's laid out, the things that Robert Bigelow said, the government contracts that are in writing, the reports that are in writing. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that tilts you over to thinking there might be something to it is he kind of looks like a villain from a Marvel <laughs> movie. <laughs> he does. He looks like he's... He looks like he runs a mass media empire and, you know, fucks his secretary on the desk and yells at people on the phone and is read in at the CIA, you know, like, or I don't know, something like that. <laughs> My mind goes to those places. I'm just suspicious of people like that because I never, I don't even, I don't think I've ever known anyone knowingly who's like in those circles. I've been privileged to know some pretty I mean, cool he's people. Got his own, like he's that. got his own space station. Remember, folks, if Julian says it, it must be true. <laughs> that, is, that is not true at all. Let's, just, <laughs> let's edit that one out. Christ. I try to get it right, but I don't fucking know. I'm just a podcaster. But when the other thing like that I think is often lost in these conversations is we keep talking about these people, you know, whether it be the private side people like the Musks and the Bigelows, and then, you know, on the government side, we're talking about whatever that organiza unnamed organization is, but they're all a part of these other organizations. It's always America-centric, right? So... Well, there is a reason for that. Why? It, it is believed by some people, and there's a certain amount of anecdotal evidence to support this, that back when... The, the, you know, the military and the government were first working on the UFO thing, rather it was a crash that happened in the 40s or whatever, that there was a kind of like a very covert international agreement that there was going to be this group that managed it. And it was, you know, an American centric group. And that is why you don't see ma this major disclosure. The ancient aliens did an episode about this where they're, they're basically saying that there's this group, the, uh, that goes and handles this on a worldwide basis and it's by by treaty at the very deepest levels and that that might be true but the ufo phenomenon is not american centric right. the same stuff that's happening yes. in america is happening all over the world in that's, some places even more and that's my issue because we talk about we talk about the power centric struggle of it mm -hmm. in american terms now other places i have a lot of listeners around the world who in their own countries they know more about you know this sure. talk there like you talk to nick pope as well which yeah. i want to get back to that he's from britain but you know it's like would the men in black just be American? I, no. Like, to me, no. Would would this knowledge not be some sort of – and I say this in with an understanding mindset to this. Mm -hmm. This isn't like taking a shot. I'm saying would it not be some sort of global governments coming together on agreement like at the highest levels? Like, oh, shit, people can't know about this. Right. I would understand that completely. I just feel like we look at it, and again, maybe it's just because I live here, and you know, we, we're both American, like so. This is the context we talk about it in. But you know, where's the Elon Musk in Europe? You know, where, where's the Robert Bigelow in China? They exist, I'm sure, right. but we still talk about it as if all the answers lie in D.C. or fucking Las Vegas or something. Well, you know, Americans tend to be like that anyway. Yes. We see the world through, you know, very, very narrow very focus, and we don't think internationally, and we think, you know, we're the center of everything. But there is a lot of 
people out there are a lot of people out there that will talk about the fact that this must be by some kind of clandestine international treaty that this the, this the level of secrecy is agreed upon and the processes for investigating these cases is agreed upon and it probably does come uh, largely headquartered in America but this is an organization of people like like the men in black movie you know people think that's a big comedy but and and, and it is but Based on truth. Yeah, it's quite possible that there is a very clandestine organization worldwide that is that, that manages this stuff. And and that it's 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 out of politics, it's out of international disputes, it's 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 deeper than that, it's beyond that, and it's bigger than that. And uh and there's been a lot of cases made for that being a possibility. The problem with any of this stuff, not just aliens or organizations that run that secret, but for any type of secret is or power. The buck has to stop somewhere, right? Even if we can't see it, it stops somewhere. So you talk about like ooh, a great example, like even some bullshit political example. You have socialists and libertarians, right? And I'm going to generalize here, but like on the purest end of those spectrums, the socialists would want the buck to stop with, um, in broad terms, the government handling everything. And the libertarians would want the individual handling everything. But if you go that far on the spectrum in either direction, it always ends badly. Mm -hmm. There's different ways it ends badly, but for different reasons, it ends badly. So when you're talking about now like a closely held secret like this, wherever that organization is all over the world, whoever's in it, whatever, the buck is stopping with them. So they may have made a decision based on things you said previously that I think have validity to it where you're talking about like presidents aren't even read in on this stuff or can't get to it. Someone is making that decision somewhere unelected mm -hmm. to, or a group of people to not read in like quote unquote, the most powerful person in the world. And then look at other world leaders of other major countries, the most powerful people in the world. And they're doing it out of some sort of what we hope is Altruism? Yes, and the good of humanity, but who the fuck are they to say that? Well, see, that's the thing. We don't know that, and a lot of people don't believe that. Yeah. At some point, this whoever was tasked with managing this information got bigger and bigger, more powerful, better funded, with less accountability. Yeah. And now it is being... Well, you know, people say that we have a shadow government that's running the entire planet and politicians mean nothing. Who's to say, if you just apply that, which is common understanding, to the people managing the UFO information, it's it's not a stretch to think that there's this group that's pretty much accountable to nobody uh, running this. Richard Dolan goes even farther, thinking that there's a whole uh, breakaway civilization where these guys have spaceships and all kinds of other stuff and we don't even know uh, mm. it's, you know possible i'm not signing on to that because i can't prove it i can't find the paper trail and i've looked i've looked for the paper trail about you know spacefaring submarines and, and stuff can't find anything that really indicates that these things were ever built but the back to the point there's plenty of examples throughout history of organizations and people that have this autonomy and are able to function without accountability to anybody and so, you know, if you're the guys that are managing the UFO secret and you're the guys that have that technology and you've been working with industry on a clandestine basis for what's going on a hundred years now, you're a pretty powerful group. I'll say. <laughs> for sure. And again, like there has to be, you know, you can't just like dislike a couple things that some of these organizations do and then be like well that means the whole thing has to go unfortunately the world is as we said multiple times not very complex so it's gonna th there's gonna be negative with whoever is in charge of situations like this as far as like you know closely guarded secrets it just that's that's the reality of it that that is what it is but i'm curious with all the topics you covered in the film, like, as you said, you named it Accidental Truth because of some of the quote-unquote accidental truths that were revealed through answers by, like, Lou and Chris mm -hmm. Mellon. But what was the most, if you haven't already mentioned it, what was the most shocking or, not even shocking, surprising thing that you uncovered in making this film that you didn't previously have any idea about or expectation about? I think that the, the, for me personally as the filmmaker, the most shocking thing was what we were talking about earlier the very beginning of this is that there's a good possibility that this evidence in this story has not been properly preserved. And, and yeah. that that is the thing that shocks me the most is that something of this much historical significance could be gone forever. And the, the people that knew about it 
are largely all dead. The people that were there when it began, they're largely all dead. And there's a pretty good case that some of the information and some of the evidence is not really stored in some central repository where somebody has the, the, the entire story under one roof. And that's frightening because the, the idea that it was kept a secret from all of us over these years, that's one thing. That's bad enough. But mm-hmm. the idea that it was kept a secret in such a way that maybe there's not even anybody who really knows the whole story anymore, that's really frightening. And when I first was making the film, you know, and I, and I was talking to Lou's people, they're like, well, we're working on this documentary. It's going to be the definitive UFO documentary and Lou's in it. And, and, and I'm like, look, man, I don't think you guys can make the definitive UFO documentary because you're not read in. And you're not gonna you're not gonna go the places that I've gone and tell the story that I've told because it's not part of the official line that you're gonna have to tow. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. If you want to go yeah, and yeah. make a UFO documentary where you talk to members of Congress and you talk to NASA and you talk to all these guys and you get the cooperation of all these people, you have you're telling nice. us an organized yeah. story that is not true because NASA, who just heroically said they're gonna start looking at UFOs, I mean, come on, man, really? You're gonna start looking at UFOs, NASA, <laughs> now. Okay, let's just put that one aside. Thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks for that. Appreciate it. Um, you know, so anybody that's that's going to well, we've got we've got the head of NASA, we have the the intelligence committee, we got the Secretary of Defense. Okay, like like Mike Barra says in my movie, you're not the right people to be coming out with this because you're the ones that have been lying to us for all these years. And so anybody that thinks they're going to go and, and feature all these people in in a way that I didn't do it. You know, I got to people in this movie that I shouldn't have gotten to. Nobody else can get to them in the way I did, and that because they're very protected. Even Gary Nolan now, you can't you can't get him hardly at all. He's under contract right now to not be doing these kind yeah. of appearances. Um, but we got to him fair and square. And but I did it. Usually, if you can get to the Elizondos, if you can get to the Melons, if you can get to some of the other people that are in my film you're being allowed access to them because you're pretty much agreeing that you're going to toe the line. The interview that I got with Lou Elizondo Mm. was in 2018. It was at the MUFON symposium where he came to speak. And I'll tell you, he came into that room with me. Tom DeLong was calling the whole time, telling him, get out, don't do the interview. Don't do the interview. He showed up in a bulletproof vest because he was afraid he was going to get shot. And um, Lou Elizondo was wearing a bulletproof vest in your interview. No, he took it off for the interview. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, but no, he was at the MUFON conference in a bulletproof vest. Um, It was right in the middle of the media tizzy around TTSA. And basically, everybody in TTSA was under contract. The the media surrounding that group became a very valuable asset. It turned into the show Unidentified. and, And Tom DeLong and some of the other people had plans to turn TTSA into you know a scientific research group um but also an entertainment company that basically had copyrights on pretty much anything and that, that was out there so this interview that i got with lou you see him on you see him out there all the time you see him on on podcasts you see him on on zoom calls but you don't ever see him sitting in a studio perfectly lit and with per, with good audio because there's no other interviews out there that weren't managed by ttsa in those conditions and that's what made that interview so valuable and but that's who, why I got so much resistance in using it. I was threatened over that interview. But who the fuck, like, who the fuck is Tom DeLong? Like, I obviously like he's bl- Blink One Eighty Two guy. But like, that was one of the most unintentionally funny parts in your movie when you were talking about to the stars, and you have Tom DeLong coming out on the stage talking about it, and then like, and here's his five board members. Fed, 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 and I'm just like, and and you even said like something sly, like uh, you know, obviously all CIA, NSA, so whatever. Yeah. But like, how does Tom DeLon? Like, no disrespect, he doesn't seem like the second coming of fucking Albert Einstein. How does he end up in this situation where he's like telling Lou Elizondo, like, you're gonna do what I tell you to do? Well, here's what happened. Okay, and and you know, there's <laughs> this is a very very interesting story, and um, please do tell. All right, so Tom DeLong was, and and let me let me caveat this, okay? This is my opinion. A lot of it, okay. from what I've understood, I am not going to say that everything I'm about to say in this thing is is absolute fact, but this is what my impression of what I have covered uncovered is. Tom DeLong was poking around government, 
trying to find, trying to get to people that could tell him about UFOs. And he was doing that because he was just a regular guy. Yeah, he happens to be a rock star, but he was interested in the topic. And he, and he opened a lot of doors because he, he was a rock star. Um, and before TTSA, years before that, he did a couple of UFO conferences where he talked about that. He did the International UFO Conference by, by um, he, he videotaped in. And he's like, look, I'm just like you guys. I just want to know what's going on. And, um, and, that, and, and that's all legit. In fact, I, I, there's really nothing illegit about what Tom's tried to do. Except that his whole board is fed, 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 fed. Well, fed. see, okay, so this is how it evolves. <laughs> um, so he was getting to some people, and he was getting some answers, and he was getting told some things. And when the, the powers that be behind the Lou Elizondo and the whole rollout, which I believe was a very organized thing, that they, the TTSA was waiting in the wings, Lou and Chris came forward with this information. They didn't do that in a vacuum. They were cleared to do it. But Ralph Blumenthal, who wrote the article in my movie, says, oh, no, that's not true. But if you put the pieces together, it has to be true. And maybe Ralph doesn't understand it. But when Lou wrote his resignation letter to the Department of Defense, then he went and met with Leslie Keene and Ralph Blumenthal, and, they, and he showed them, and he told them about the program. TTSA was already formed, organized, and ready to go. It didn't just form in two weeks. So what it looks like to me is that all of these guys had this plan to, be, to roll out TTSA and at, as a way of opening up information to the public that was going to be very organized and very, screwed, very well done. Tom DeLong made himself very useful to the powers that be because they're like, wait a minute, let's put this whole thing under this guy. Blink-182 for aliens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He was, he was um, Leslie Keene in, in that, um, that series that J.J. Abrams produced was talking about Tom DeLong's role in it. And she actually said that he was a useful idiot to these people. <laughs> um, I think that's horrible. Yeah, I think that's horrible that she said that. She might um, be right, though. But it might not be far from the yeah. truth. But, you know, bless Tom. It's kind of funny. <laughs> but the uh, anyway, so the TTSA was waiting in the wings with this fundraising thing. They came out, Tom DeLong on stage. He had all these guys. Now, all these guys had been brought into this organization. It didn't happen by accident. This was how they decided they were going to begin this rollout. When Lou submitted his resignation letter and went to the, to the, to the New York Times, he submitted that resignation letter. He lost a certain amount of retirement income from resigning early from one of the organizations that he worked with. But he did that, in my opinion, because he knew that he was going to jump onto the TTSA and they were going to go out and raise millions and millions right. of dollars. Unfortunately, they only raised like $2.7 million. It wasn't enough. And um, so basically over time, the whole, and for a variety of reasons, that organization kind of imploded. It's still out there. It's still doing things. It still has some of its original members, but they never raised the millions and millions and millions of dollars they thought they were going to raise. So what happened then is that, you know, Lou and everybody kind of branched out. The whole plan fell apart. And the TTSA taking the lead and leading everybody toward disclosure. That was plan A for getting this technology to the mainstream is TTSA is going to bring it and bubble it up. Well, that didn't work. And then all these unexpected FOIA releases came out. And then the Defense Intelligence Agency releases these DIRDs that supposedly came out of Bigelow Aerospace investigating dozens of different technologies that we don't have. The whole thing is, is the result of, a, of an organized plan going sideways. And it's because what we're witnessing in the mainstream is an internal battle between the people that manage this information and want it out and the people that manage this information and don't want it out. And does the, does the former really exist, though? There is, there, in my opinion, again, you know, if I knew all this stuff, then, that, then we'd all know it, right? Um, yeah, there's factions that, that, that think that there needs to be more disclosure, and there's factions that think absolutely not. And there's a lot of reasons. You know, that's, it. that's the other thing that we have to think about is what is the real reason for this secrecy? Obviously, a logical argument for that is that one of the reasons for the secrecy is that the uh, people don't need to know. It could upset society. That's been the oldest reason given, mm -hmm. and it still has a certain amount of validity. But, you know, the, I think the other reason is the technology. The people that have it don't want to share it, um, and they don't want to have to explain where they got it. So, and you're dealing with corporations. 
if Lockheed Martin developed the coding for the stealth fighter because they got something off of a spaceship and it's, um, you know, it's anti-radar, blah, 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 and now it's on our stealth fighters and they're the only ones that have it, why do they want to tell anybody where they got it? Right. And then now you're dealing with corporations and money. But the other thing is, what is the context of this information? And, and what, what I mean, mean by that, okay, so you hear the question all the time. Well, the public's ready for it. And you, you might say, yeah, we're ready for it. But, you know, the question is, we're, we're ready for it only if the context is, is okay. Right, 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 right. So, so it's, it's no longer an answer. It's no longer a question that can be answered with, of course we're ready. It's a question that has to be caveated with, well, it's going to depend on what it, the implications are. Yes, you can't know if it's ready unless you know what it is. Which, yeah. you know. I mean, if they, if, if, if they come out tomorrow and they say, oh, hey, there's aliens out there, uh, but, you know, they leave us alone, we leave them alone, we don't really know what's going on, we've had brief interactions, but, you know, they're, they're very superior to us and they don't really see us as, as much, but they're not going to hurt us. And then people are going to go, yeah, we knew of something like that. And they're going to get up the next day and they're going to do largely what they did the day before. But if it comes out, hey, there's aliens out there. We think they might have nefarious plans for us. Hell, we might be being raised for food. Who knows? We don't, we don't know. But they're dangerous and so we can't defend against them. That changes your daily life as of now. So the context of disclosure, what it means to how it affects you personally, is really what the societal reaction is going to be. I'm I'm gonna play a guess game with this because I don't obviously don't know. But when you're sitting across from a guy like Lou, and he's saying I can't talk about this, I can't talk about that. But he has flown out here to this conference on Mufon. He's a part of a at the time growing endeavor called To the Stars. Has a family at home. From I when talking to other people who know him, like James Fox, like good guy, goes about life, you know, does his thing. If he had possession personally of information that quite literally defined the meaning of life and perhaps did it on a level where it was the type of stuff that if people found out the world would riot and humanity would end because we'd figure out that there maybe wasn't a point to it or like we're all simulated or something like that. I don't know how he would sit there and, like, not to go, like, graphic with it, but I don't know how he wouldn't, like, I don't know how he'd want to live or interact, you know? So when I think about, because he's the one facing the camera, right? We don't know mm -hmm. all the guys that are facing the camera right. and what they think and whether they're at the bottom of a whiskey bottle right now. But he, by all intents and purposes, seems to be, like, a barely normal guy. I don't know him, but that's just how it comes across. You know, if it were that deep... Or if he knew that a secret alien overlord were running the earth from below the sea or something like that. I don't think he'd be able to sit there and have a conversation on camera at the fucking new MUFON conference. You know? I got, okay, I got to tell you, you haven't seen the whole conversation because we talked about that. And one of the things that he told me, and, and it's, it's in the interview. The, the whole interview will see the light of day one day, but I'm, I'm being, even though it's my interview, I own it. He agreed to do it. He signed off on it. I still have gotten a lot of resistance. From who? From people that represent Lou. And who are these people? Is it like some secretary or is it, you know, someone deep throat on the phone? Media reps. People people that have that that that, that see him as a valuable piece of intellectual property. And what do they say to you? And do they do they call you? Do they show up at your house? Like how does that it's not it's not that clandestine um basically when i uh when when i sold the the doc to to the distributor you know it was originally going to be called the elizondo tapes and people that represent lou came and said no you can't even use that interview unless we agree to let you and i said well it's my interview i'll do whatever i want to with it and then the distributor came to me and said well we understand that it's your interview but you're going to have to play nice with these guys or we're not going to buy your movie and we're not going to release your movie. What so, year was that? This was back when I when I signed the deal to about two years ago. So it was the movie was originally going to be called the Elizondo tapes. Yeah, that's what my original contract was, because I have a whole bunch of stuff, more stuff that is very very controversial that's in my interview and within some other information. So, 
based on this resistance and then the fact that you were getting a lot of other information that wasn't necessarily directly related to that. I, I, I turned the corner with the movie because, um, A, they weren't going to let me call it the, the Elizondo tapes, and B, I, I'd gotten that's when I brought in Michio Kaku and Gary Nolan and all these other people yeah. to make it bigger than just Lou Elizondo because if I continued down the track of making it about Lou and making it about the stuff that he told me that, that, that you know to this day is not out, um, I was going to have a lot of problems getting the film out. In Were fact, you scared of that? I was very scared, yeah. yeah. I've been... Um, it, the film came out April 18th, 2023, and until midnight on April 17th, before I saw that icon pop up on um, Amazon Prime, I was, still was not convinced it was ever going to see the light of day. The The story of of the beginning of this ordeal of making the film all the way to seeing it out in the public... If I if if making my next film means I have to go through what I've been through for the last two years, I I don't care if I ever pick up a video camera again as long as I live. It's it's been I can't even describe it. And there's a lot of stuff I just can't even talk about. And there's stuff that even if I did talk about, you'd just think I was crazy. But you said it's less clandestine than we think. It's pretty straightforward. That particular element of it was less clandestine. Yeah. What other elements are there? Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> You're you're giving a lot today, so I'm okay with that. Well, I mean, you know, the thing is, is that I was I was totally under surveillance the whole time I was making the movie. My phone, and this comes with the territory with being part of MUFON. They're under surveillance anyway, by by people that are keeping track of what the UFO community is doing. It just it comes with the territory. You take it for granted. Your phone's tapped. They're watching your computer. Uh, if they feel like it, they're following you. Every once in a while, you find some little evidence in your house. That like somebody like like stuff moved that there's no explanation for how it got moved. It's a little calling card. We can we can we can get to you, you know. Like it <laughs> it, it happens, and it sounds like something right out of a freaked out movie. And I don't want to be the guy out there saying it because it just makes me look stupid. But I've lived it. It it it's part of the thing. And the the information in Accidental Truth, there's a lot of people that didn't want that stuff out. And there's and there's still a lot of people that don't want it out. And there's still an active effort to quash the film, even though it's out. And I have had to, at every turn in the process of making this movie, I've had to understand what I was up against, and I've had to adjust my trajectory to sidestep their latest attempt to put obstacles in front of me. Despite the fact that it came across as far more out in the open as you would have thought. You know, I, and, I, and my head's, well, go, well, my no, head's like going what, on. My like, head's going on. Like, what do you mean? Meaning, the, the way you started this by saying it's a lot less clandestine than you think. No, no. The, the situation with, with, um, with media representation by some of the people that were in it, some of the threats that I got over using certain things in the film. Um, that, what, is, what does a threat look like or sound like? If you put this out there in this way, I'm going to sue you. That's what it looks like. Okay, so fairly. So, so when I say less okay. clandestine, that's what I mean. Got it. You know, so nobody, it wasn't, nobody. It wasn't like you know, do you like your dog? Not directly. Like okay. no, 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 no. Okay. Because I still have the dog. So, you know, that's, just, good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You know, I, I just. No, I'm not. I, I was never like threatened in that direct manner. But I was, I was basically some of the content that was that was supposed to be in the film was pretty much nixed by the threat of the film won't come out. Some of the actions that I threatened to take to preserve my right to release the film was nixed in. You can go in that direction, but we're going to put your film on a shelf till it's over. And so the some of the powers that be that that managed to get a certain amount of control over the film used it to do as much manipulating as they could, and um, and I did everything I could to get around that, including hiring lawyers over fair use, hiring lawyers over witness protection, and and you know whistleblower stuff, just to find out you know what the implications were of revealing some of the information. And there's information that I didn't put in the film that could technically be termed as classified still. And if you put that out, even though you got it from a non-classified source, you can still get in trouble for revealing classified information. Really? Yeah. If you, even if you don't know? If you know it's classified and you, if put, you, it, know. you put it out anyway. But couldn't you have deniability on that? Like, I didn't, I didn't know it was classified. Really? You want to sit in a room with a bunch of FBI guys and try to pull that off? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> 
I always forget they hold the cards. They, it's already predetermined what they're going to do. And, and you know, fair. the truth is that I would wake up in the middle of the night sometimes, it, it, and my hard drive's chattering away, and this happened about every week. Your they're hard drive's what? Chattering away in the middle of the night, and I look at my computer, and you can tell data is being transferred across the internet. They're they're basically harvesting my hard drive, keeping up with, I believe, keeping up with what I was doing with this movie and keeping an eye on it. And and I I still to this day think the only reason that it's out is because I was al- it was allowed to be put out not because I forced my way into the public with it. Did you find? I mean, you've already kind of said like there's some things you didn't put in there. Obviously, so it's a piece of it. But you also said that it started off as the Elizondo tapes, and then you went with a lot of the other information you have to make an amalgamation. You know, not just completely focused on him, even though he was still heavily featured in it. Like, do you think you heavily were creating and in and while in the creating process self-censoring out of that fear absolutely yeah there was i mean there was a lot of things that i just didn't put in there because i didn't want to i didn't want to leave stains on the people in the movie you know like the people that said that there's a lot of stuff in the film where people said something and then went whoops but there's mm. a whole lot more that never that will not see the light of day because at the end of the day i promised myself two things one is I wasn't going to denigrate anybody. You know, and I don't know if you notice this in the film, but we don't ask, we don't tell people what to think. We don't say, hey, this yeah. person's not telling the truth. We don't say, hey, this person's a bad person. We don't, we don't do any of that. We present you the evidence. You can watch what's being said and you can make up your own mind. And I'll tell you something that people that watch the movie the first time, they don't get. The first time you watch it, it's, eh, it's cool, it's interesting, blah, blah, blah. The second time you watch it, you start to understand that a lot of what some of these people are saying is not true. They're, 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 they're not telling the truth. And then when you get to the third or fourth time that you watch it, it really starts to sink in. And um, that's, the, that's the magic of this film. It's like onions. You, you're peeling away a layer every time. How do you, like, what were some of the, is it like a poker type thing? Like there's just some telltale language and, and, and body language patterns? Or was it more you were figuring out based on other testimony you were getting that this doesn't line up? Both. I mean, for one thing, um, there's a rumor, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I tend to think that it is. I uh, love rumors. <laughs> there, there's a rumor that John Alexander pulled Lou Elizondo aside at the very beginning of all this and said, don't do UFO conferences because these people know the questions to ask and they're going to get you. And this was right about the time I interviewed him and I knew the questions to ask. And there's a lot of times in this interview, like you were talking about um, knowing if something's harmful or not. In, in the interview, Lou says, there's, there's reasons for concern. <laughs> says that fear, I wouldn't go that far, but we definitely need to be concerned. And, and he said that. And I didn't use it in the film, but yeah, he told me that. And he said it to other places too. The, the, the reason this was going to originally be called the Elizondo tapes is because I considered the, there's a big gotcha in the movie around Lou. And it was friendly, and the interview continued afterwards. And it basically comes around him pretty much inadvertently admitting that there's a non-human intelligence or at least some kind of alternative unknown intelligence that's a part of all this. And, and, it, and he says it, but he doesn't mean to say it. And that's where the whole title, Accidental Truth, comes from, was that statement. And that's why it was originally going to be the Elizondo tapes. But then as I started, because I've got a bunch of stuff, like that, that tape where he's talking about the isotopic ratios of metals. That was from an interview that he did in a Washington, D.C. hotel with somebody from MUFON before this whole thing really blew mm. up. So, 45 minute tape. The section of it that I used is where he talks about the metallurgy and he basically admits in the thing, it's like, look, it's not that these materials, we don't know what they are because we can study metals. We know the periodic tables. Anybody can figure out what's, what an object is. But there's isotopic ratios in these in these materials that just simply can't. They indicate that they cannot have been made on Earth because it, there's a whole science behind it, um, and Gary Nolan goes on to to confirm that as well. The the isotopic ratios of the, it's molecular things that have to do with the environment they're manufactured in, and like you can have titanium on Earth and it's got a certain isotopic ratio, which is which is a molecular configuration. You could have titanium that was manufactured somewhere else. The isotopic ratios will be different. 
and mm. they cannot be changed. So, so in other words, you can you can say, okay, this is this is titanium manufactured. It's got a certain isotopic ratio throughout all the elements in the titanium that made it. The different metals that came together. Now, if you have a piece of titanium, and it's got all the same elements, but the ratios of the isotopes are different, that indicates that it wasn't made in ways that we understand. And so Lou says that on the tape. Now, there's you know, two and a half minutes of this tape that I used in the film. It's a 45 minute tape. There's less than 10 minutes I used at this interview with Lou. It's a, it's a 45 minute interview. Um, and so originally I thought I had enough material just around my Lou Elizondo material to make something pretty striking. And, um, that got, that got kiboshed real fast. And then, um, so that's when I brought in all these other people. And that's when I came up, it wasn't the Elizondo tapes anymore. It was accidental truth because I got a lot of other people to kind of accidentally tell me something too. Based on how you're talking about Lou now after the fact and after the documentary is even out, you know, I, you may have said this, but the first question would be have have some of those same people who represented him reached out since the doc came out? I can't remember if you explained that. And then the other question is, do you think he would ever sit down and do an interview with you again? Um, you know, a lot of the stuff I've literally been, uh, you're good. You're good. Good. <laughs> a lot of the stuff to answer your question, I've literally been demanded not to talk about, but what I will say is that, uh, Lou and I had a, a very good text rapport right up until right about before the movie came out and before other people stepped in, I was texting him constantly and he was telling me how he was very supportive of the film. He hoped it did well. He was willing to do social media and, and a bunch of other stuff to help mm. us. And then all of a sudden that quashed, that exchange ended. And when did that end? Film came out April, 2023. When did that end? Yeah, it was right, right, right before the film came out, right when, when uh, other people stepped in to manage my access to to Lou. okay but you had you had long since obviously changed the film name mm -hmm. and changed the focus because some of these people had already talked to you for years before that and so now they came right. back in and this time when they came in he also went out yeah for yeah. good you haven't talked to him i haven't at talked all. to him since in fact i was told not to try to reach out to him directly meet the media rep told you that Sketchy, sketchy, sketchy. It's very sketchy. And, and um, I don't know what the reasons are, but the whole, everything about my relationship with Lou changed when it became about, see, here's what's happened to ufology. When I, when I interviewed him in 2018, it was very, very warm. We had a fantastic conversation and we had a good rapport ever since. But, you know, the, Uf the UFO field for a long time has been about people dedicated people doing lifelong work that never really had anything to show for it except that they cared. Well, now all of a sudden there's money in UFOs and there are sharks in the water and the water's getting bloody. And there are people who will stop at nothing to get their share of it. And there are people who stop at nothing to keep their share of it. And so what's happening is you've already got a field that is already baked in disinformation and secrecy and treachery and now there's money in it too. And what you're seeing happen is, is a war over not only the truth in ufology, but there's a war over the money and there's a war over who gets to tell the story and there's a war over who gets to be the big boy on the block. And a lot of the people that are fighting to maintain their position are people that are telling the story that's authorized to be told. And, um, and then there's other people that are telling stories that are so outrageous that nobody's going to believe them. And they're serving their purpose too. Because if you have people that are, that are just, you know, so tinfoil hatted out that the public rolls their eyes, then they're more likely to believe the official narrative. Yes. And, and my film Accidental Truth is not about the official narrative. It's about why the official narrative isn't true and, and what, what the true story is. But it's also about, um, it's not about the sensationalism that is usually the opposite end of the spectrum. It's about, hey, let's reel this in and, and let's let's prove something and let's lay down the, 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 what I consider to be as close to the authentic tale of what's happened over the last X number of years that that we can that we can make a reasonable case for. And it's a story that 
nobody wants told. The reality is with anything, be it ufology, insert industry here, people got to make money. They got to make a living, right? Mm -hmm. The difference is are the people who are gluttonous about it and that's what drives them totally and they will stab everything in the back that moves to stop their ability to make the maximum amount versus the people who are like, yeah, I want to be compensated for my great work and I want to be respected for it. But like, I'm here to work to move forward the value of what this industry does or what this company does or something like that. When I hear about the gates around the kingdom, as you're referring to right there, I'm glad you put that into two boxes. You have the box on the one hand where it's like, well, are there people who are directly being set up here to give out specific information on behalf of what the government once released? And then are there people also who are just in here who now see dollar signs and go, ooh, I can just talk about UFOs and make a lot of money on it? You know, that's the the problem is when you're dealing with something that is – cast it into conspiracy theory land and and painted mm -hmm. a certain way by the mass media and the general public all it takes is a few bad apples to ruin the whole thing and basically sure. become the definition of it we <laughs> talked about this with something a little bit earlier but yeah. right on the head here of the actual industry itself you know if if i'm going to talk with people on my little platform here to to discuss the phenomenon and stuff I want it to be the legit people. I want it to be the people where it's like, hey, you don't have to agree with everything they're saying. You can refute some of the evidence if you have better evidence. All for that. But these are genuine people who are trying to get to something here, who who aren't who aren't just complete disinformation agents. And I'm going to add into that, by the way, some of those people who are working on behalf of the government. I understand sure. their role. It's not like I'm sitting here ripping all of them. Are there some that maybe it's like, okay, it's very, very obvious. And like, you seem to be just totally full of shit. Sure. But like, I'm not saying that about Lou. I'm not saying that about Chris Mellon. You know, there, there's value to be had there. And I think it's the audience's job to to take away what you can and try to find, you know, get your best guess at, at what is believable and what is not. Well, see, it's not that I don't think that Lou or Chris either are full of shit. I think that what we're dealing with here is that at the beginning of this 2017, there was this decision made by a lot of people that we're going to roll this out, but we're going to do it with this new narrative. And, the, and again, the new narrative is whitewashes everything from the end of Blue Book all the way till the beginning of ATIP and pretends there was no official government study of this in that time. When, and, and that is ultimately where all the deception and all the lies are buried, and that's why they're whitewashing it with the new story. So when TTSA rolled out, they were going to be the vehicle for the new narrative. That's why you have all these CIA guys, you know, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah they, we're, 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 we're telling this story and we're this vehicle that's going to do it. And Tom DeLong. And, yeah, and, and I'm not sure that Tom fully understood the, 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 his, his purpose in this, but... That, in my opinion, that's what it was. And then now, and even then, but especially now, if you are a threat to that new narrative, you're not getting to any of these guys. You're not. I, I got to Gary Nolan, but I was one of the last people. That, and, and the interview I did with Lou is one of the only ones. And the fact that I was able to get to Chris Mellon and press him on the question, these were all anomalies. That's why this movie is an anomaly, because the information and the questions I was able to ask these people are questions they will not answer now to anybody. And so the, you know, the, the fact that, um, that you can go and, and, and get to these guys and ask these questions, I got very, very lucky because you can't do that now. Now, Lou does a lot of these podcasts and stuff, but he's still only saying things that, he's, that, that are on a very tightly controlled rail, and he's going further and further. Um, but he still, he still knows what he can say and what he can't say. And in, in the film, he pretty much adhered to that. And in the interview I did with him, he adhered to it, but there were just a couple times when he slipped cause I knew what questions to ask. Um, I wasn't trying to get him, get him, but in the back of my mind, I wanted to, to get him to tell me something, um, in as friendly a way as you could possibly do that. So if you're, if you're towing the line for the new narrative, and you know who you are. <laughs> if you're towing the line for the new narrative, then you're in the club. You're in the club that gets access to the government interviews. You're in the club that gets the, gets the head guys to come and be in your movie. 
you're you're in that club as long as you're towing the, the new narrative line and you're willing to to cooperate with this oh yeah there was nothing going on for 50 years that's that's the most important thing to to adhere to is to not call attention to those periods of time when all of this was was evolving yeah there's something patternistically interesting about that when you think about things outside of space things outside of aliens that have also happened in that course of history like you're saying from project blue book basically to you know the last decade 2017 there wasn't anything and that's the narrative look at like space exploration though too we got to the moon in 1969 Mm -hmm. suddenly it wasn't important to get to the moon or like go beyond that you know we had the you know there was supposedly there was still some there were still some trips, you know, and you've had you had a couple of unfortunate, very sad incidents. Eighty six with the Challenger, O sure. three with what was that? The Columbia, I want to say, whatever mm-hmm. that one was, where it crashed as it was coming, yeah. it like blew up as it was coming back in the atmosphere. So it's not like you didn't have space exploration, but space kind of took a back seat. It went from the race to space, hire all the ex Nazis to get us, you know, right. rockets to the moon and everything, and then oh, we got there and everyone chill. So. It's interesting to me that there also is like a break in the action and they're even reporting that as the official narrative right. in like ufology and Well, see, they the say that space. we got warned off the moon and told just to stay stay put. And then there's other people that say that uh, that, that there's a whole, you know, that there's a whole subsequent space operation, a secret space program where we have <laughs> advanced technology. I can't prove any of that. I, I didn't want to make a film where I'm saying things that, that I can't show you know, a paper trail. If I had, hey, they're they're secretly launching secret space program ships off of, uh, you know, Diego Garcia, where nobody can see the rockets go up, and and we have proof that we have bases on Mars and all this kind of thing. If if I could find a shred of evidence that is as definitive as the stuff I try to present in the film to support that, then I would present it. Do I believe it? I'm not sure because I haven't seen the evidence. I'm discerning. I'm not somebody that just wants to drink the Kool-Aid. Mm. I want to know. You're going to have to make a solid case for me. I'm not going to be like, oh, I believe it because I want to believe it. And, and that's, that's important. Well, it's, it's about journalism, right, at the end of the day. It's not about just being, oh, my gosh, you know, I think this is true and it must be true. And, and so I'm going to make movies about it. I've never been that person and, and I'm not going to do it now. And so that's why the, the film that I made, it's, everything's got a reasonable amount of of evidence to support it, even if it's anecdotal and even if it's circumstantial. Well, you, you keep on. You've brought up Dr. Gary Nolan. He's a doctor, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's a okay. he's a professor of pathology. Actually. I always err on that side. Yeah. I was pretty sure that sounded right in my head, but I had to make sure. You brought him up a few times today, and you've talked a little bit about like some of the testing he's done. Mm-hmm. But one of the things you talk about in your documentary is how seemingly according to him he fell into this kind of by accident and if i remember this correctly it had to do with he was studying like cancer or something metallically is that does that well there's two things that that his work led him to one is he developed a special type of mass spectrometry the guy's a genius english yeah (laughs) what does that that mean that's where you could put a a piece of something into a machine and it'll tell you what it's made of okay um so he developed a very specialized version of that the guy, the guy is quite a genius, and I think he's he's become rich off of some of the stuff that he's invented and patented. And um, he's out of Stanford too. Yeah, right? he's at Stanford. Yeah. Okay. Um, so he he invented a certain type of mass spectrometry, and one of the things that they were using in it was like a metal tag to to give a consistent reading throughout stuff. So you know, like you'll you'll tag something with something you know, so that you can use it to gauge anomalous responses by the machine. Does that make sense? Yes. So in other words, if you have a piece of aluminum and you put it in with another sample, as long as that piece of aluminum comes out reading exactly like that piece of aluminum should read, then you can rely on the other readings because you have the piece of aluminum to gauge the the exactness of the machine's makes work. Sense. So he had developed this special type of mass spectrometry that used metal tags. And the, he was approached and he says, yeah, I have this machine. Nobody else has. And so he got the chance to to study materials. I can't remember. Did he say who approached him? Well, the, he he said uh, um, Jacques Vallée was one of them. Mm, and Jacques has the some famous of the stuff. French scientist. Yeah, he's got some of the materials from Brazil, from UFO things, possibly James Fox's, possibly other ones. Um, that's it, it's well known. 
And but he also says, you know, I was approached by Jacques and others, <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the biggest cool things in the movie is that um, I, I, you know, I researched him and he did an interview with Jesse Michaels where he told this guy, Jesse's a podcaster. He says he told him supposedly that he can show you some of this stuff, but I can't show you other stuff because of uh, national security concerns. But then he went on the Lex Friedman interview. Um, Lex Friedman's show, and he said, yes, I've been given stuff by people, you know, not like the government or anybody. And so I confronted him on that. I'm like, look, in one podcast, you said you had stuff you couldn't show because of national security concerns. And then in another interview, you said you hadn't been given materials by the government. So kind of, which is it? And that's, mm. you know, that's another accidental truth moment in the film where he just kind of, you know, his response is, is worth the four ninety nine. <laughs> so that's... um. That's the, that's the kind of thing that you see in the movie, but it's very clear that he's been studying classified materials that are of unknown origin. And what he will tell you off camera, very candidly, um, it confirms that. But what we what we put in the movie confirms it. And then he went on to uh, uh, he was given um, brain scans of victims of the Havana syndrome. Oh, yeah. Okay. So and he was he was studying those. And um, through the course of that, he actually, he got to the point where uh, he was able to identify certain aspects of that and that, yeah, the, these people were being injured by artificial means and, and, and then he kicked it back to wherever he got it. Um, what did he discuss? I don't know as much about that. So did he discuss about whether or not the findings conclude that it could be human made versus something that maybe is not? Not nothing with the Havana syndrome that that although they, they you know they don't understand the technology that's causing this, yeah. but but I I believe from what he told me and it's not in the film so I don't remember every aspect of it but he said that he was able to determine that yes there was there was something happening to these people and across these different specimens and and um, MRIs there was something consistent that that had in common and at that point he's done. He's, he's done his research work. He's mm. returned his reports to whoever gave him the, the stuff to look into. But at the same time, he was applying some of these same readings to people like experiencers and remote viewers. And people experiencers are people who like got abducted supposedly had some kind of not encounter with a non human intelligence. That whole, that whole phraseology kind of has to expand at this yeah. point. Yeah. And we could talk about that if you want, but sure. he found, he found an anomaly in the brains of people that have heightened psychic abilities our, our remote viewers have had these kind of experiences where there's a part of the brain called the basal ganglia that has heightened activity. And, um, what he found mm. is that when he started, when he did more research into what the basal ganglia is, it's long been associated with heightened perception, heightened awareness and intuition and things like that. Um, and now he's got scientific evidence that, that people that are having these experience have this heightened activity in this part of the brain. So in some cases it's more developed. So that's the whole last third of the movie is talking about how we now have actual evidence that people that are having certain experiences have a slightly different brain physiology than people that aren't. And he's found that these people are, um, they tend to seek each other out. They tend to find each other. Then, and, and and like you'll find couples that both have the same thing going on with their brains, and that it is almost like a whole other classification of Homo sapien that has this this level and this this, this type of brain, and that he thinks and that there's all kinds of different methods of communication, all kinds of different methods of information transfer. And this is all the, the what the last part of the movie is about is how this all interacts with consciousness that we don't know about, but that yes. our evolution has learned to latch onto. And so this thing that he's discovered in the basal ganglia of of the brain among certain people that have certain abilities and experiences in common is indicating to us that our physiology is adapting to stuff that we're not aware of, you know, on a scientific yes. basis. No, I was thinking, as you were saying this, the thing that's blowing my mind is I hadn't thought about that in the context of, like, some of the non-alien stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I, now my head may be going way above my pay grade thinking about this, but, you know... We're, we're way above our pay grade. Yeah. I mean, fuck, <laughs> we need Michio Kaku back. I know, I know. <laughs> I've got to get him back down here. But, like, thinking about, like, let's use the Havana mm -hmm. syndrome example, because there's been, you know, there's people that 
try to claim like, oh, no, it's in their heads or whatever. But I, I've been trying to get this one fucking guy in here for 16 months now. I started emailing him like March 2022, and I've never heard a word back. So if someone has an in to him, this guy Mark Polymeropoulos, he was a CIA agent who apparent very high up, who apparently has severe Havana syndrome. And he's been on some other podcasts talking about it. Actually, shit, he was on Sean Ryan. I could ask Sean for that. Fuck, I just figured that out. Anyway, but maybe we'll get him in here. Like, I hear guys like that talk, and instantly when it's a CIA guy, some people say, like, oh, it could be a government disinformation agent. But, like, I believe him when I hear him talking about this. Mm -hmm. And I also hear some of the evidence where people try to say that, like, oh, it's just a heightened sense of awareness and paranoia that exists in people. And I go... Well, that could be true too, but when you hear the level of some of these symptoms and the lengths the government has gone to like ignore it or like cover it up or mm-hmm. not even in Mark's case, like for a long time, provide the right health care for him to get treated on it, I start to go, well, maybe this is like instantly they'll say like, oh, China, Russia, whatever, and just go to the regular culprits. Maybe it's, it's something that is, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, extraterrestrial so to speak and i don't mean that by like aliens maybe it's like maybe it is like a different vibrating frequency in like Mm -hmm. the multiverse and which i may be misreading some of what you said but that's where my head was going to with what gary was talking about with this yeah so um we talked briefly about it i didn't put it in the film because the havana syndrome doesn't have anything to do with you know the other stuff But, but basically the way he summed it up to me as best as I can remember, is that yes, I was given all of these these MRIs in this in this brain scan uh, technology. I was able to find things that correlated, and I was able to identify that yes, this was an injury to these people. And so at that point, he said, I didn't study it any further. I don't know who's doing it or where it came from, but that was a different framework than what he discovered with the basal ganglia in people. It was two different things. And so he started to find these anomalies among certain people. And it was about the same time he was doing the Havana stuff. So he was able to, to kind of correlate different things going on in the brains of different people. And that's when he stumbled on the, he, he literally mm. stumbled on it. The basal ganglia research it was something that he found by accident. But he was also able to validate the Havana syndrome stuff, that, that it is something that is, you know, it's, it's a common, it's, it's, it's similar in all of the people that were studied, and it is something that was affected by external forces. Mm. That's a whole, yeah, I have to do a podcast on that. I know that's like a separate thing, but I'm just so fascinated by that because that could happen to technically anyone. Like there's, you know, it's not just like some warfare among like agents and stuff like it, it has happened to citizens well i mean the idea that we don't have something that i could point at you right now and affect your brain in any number of ways is i'm sure we have that by now yeah you know i'm surprised they're not using it in warfare right now i mean why why attack a trench with bombs when you could just aim a beam at them and and make them go crazy we I know li- we have that stuff we live in a world where that on the wall right there that picture right. of the nuke going off is what we think about as like the thing that all these countries have that could end it but like there's far more invisible simpler ways that they could do that on a way higher level at a more effective kill rate that exists in the palms of the hands of humanity right now biological warfare uh, microwave warfare if that is the case you know it it just i keep saying this on podcasts but it every day it feels more true it's like society seems more and more fragile at all times well, you know, John Alexander, one of the things that's well known about him is that he headed up a, a program for the Army looking into non-lethal weapons technology, okay? And on the surface, you'd think, well, what does that mean? Oh, you know, rubber bullets, right? Or, or you know, electric, electricity, whatever. <laughs> but during one of our interviews, he said something about how he was down in Brazil working with shamans while he was doing, while he was involved in the non-lethal weapons technology research, and that went over my head, and 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 I didn't I didn't follow up. But then when Chris O'Brien, I don't know if you know who Chris is, he's um he he's one who's considered one of the definitive experts on cattle mutilations. He's written a bunch of books, hmm. um, but but he him and I have made several movies together. So he helped me with Accidental Truth. He's helped James too on the phenomenon and on Moment of Contact. Hmm. But when Chris was reviewing the footage, he's like, do you understand what this guy just said when he said that? 
And I'm like, no, what do you mean? He's <laughs> like, he's, he's with shamans in South America studying non-lethal weapons technologies. His big, Alexander's background, there's pictures, a lot of stuff with, uh, you know, like black magic and all kinds of mm. esoteric stuff. This guy's in, in non-lethal weapons research looking at, at, at literally casting spells and, and etheric stuff. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the, so, so I asked him about that. He's like, yeah, that it's, we, we, I, I wasn't looking at rubber bullets, dude. I mean, these guys are looking at ways to control energy that we don't see and affect people's souls and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. It, this is the kind of stuff they were looking into. What if they have it and they're already doing it? It's quite they've possible. they've done it to you and me. Yeah. Well, at least we're lucky enough to not know it. <laughs> I guess. Uh, you know, ignorance is bliss. We get that. to have this crazy illusion that we're making the movie we want to make or we're living the life we want to live. I, you know, I think it, it's it's better than being locked up in a gulag in China. Yes. I'll, yeah. I'm, hey, I'm with you. I am with you there. You got to look. What is it? The glass half full? Yeah. That's what you got to do. I mean, you know, I wake up every day and at, at least I have the illusion that I'm doing what I want to do. And, and, and I have a lot to be grateful for in the, in the life that I live. Um well, you know what? You said something in the car earlier, You're just making me think of it now. Because oh, the illu the illusion of doing what I want to do. This this blew my mind. Okay, you were... the rabbit hole is about to get deeper. Yes, let's go right down it. That's why I'm bringing it up. <laughs> you were saying to me, how did you put it? Where, where you were asking me about like this podcast or something? Like, do I ever feel like I'm a passenger or something like that? Well, yeah, because okay, so this this is what started the conversation, and I honestly, there's seven billion people on the planet. I don't know who I would say eight, this to, eight now. Yeah. <laughs> but for some reason, I just brought it up. You know, that's you have a very disarming quality about you, and and also since we're going to do this show, I was like, well, you know, let's dig into some philosophical <laughs> stuff. So I just wanted to mention it to you, but. There's been so many times in my life where I've done something that could be considered a significant accomplishment. And I remember having done it, but I don't really remember the process of actually getting it done. Mm -hmm. I can stand back and I can look at something I did and it's like, wow, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll be doing something like building a new studio or writing a book or like even when I sit down to do an edit session, it's almost like I'm on autopilot. And I got to the point where I'm questioning, am I driving this car or am I in the passenger seat watching it being driven? And, and, and that brings up this whole question of, do we have free will or an illusion of free will? And is this reality that we're in, are we on a tram half of the time, like a ride at Disneyland, or are we really in the driver's seat in our own experience? And I've really started to question that. And I, I I've got some theories about that that are, that are very interesting. Share. <laughs> well, Now's the time. I shared them with you before, but if the universe works as a, as a simulation, a okay. program. Mm -hmm. And and people say, hold on, stop right there, dude. We're not plugged into a matrix. But let's look at this for just a second. Could be. This table, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now most of science will agree at this point that this table is not really here. This is energy vibrating at a certain frequency to give us the illusion of solid matter. Okay, that this is not far-fetched stuff. This is something that Dr. Cockrey would sit here and yes. go, yeah, that's what we've determined. Yes. So we could determine that. So that means matter is an illusion. So that means everything around us is literally an illusion. I personally think that our brains are wired to interpret these, these electromagnetic energy patterns and render them like a computer would into real stuff that we can interact with. But uh, let's just go back to the basics of this isn't really here. It's an illusion. Then let's look at what runs the universe. The it's very simple mathematics. It's the Fibonacci sequence. It's mm. pi. You find that the things that make things work within this universe, within physical reality, are based on just two or three very simple mathematical formulas in repeating sequences that give us the shapes, that give us the way things work, that give us the way gravity works, blah, 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 right? Yeah. So what is that? Well, that's a program. By any, it's, a, it's mathematical algorithms creating a result. Zeros and ones. So, so we have an illusionary reality. <laughs> we have an entire system that is run on code. Well, what is that besides a simulation? So even with what we know about the way the universe works and we can say science pretty much agrees that, that, that this is true, there's no way around the fact that that is very comparable to the very simulations we're creating. 
A computer game works the exact same way. There's illusionary matter. We don't see it until we turn to it. We don't walk on the ground until we move forward. We don't hear it until until we take an action that hits it. We don't. It doesn't render for us until we're right in the middle of it. So, like right now, I'm I'm seeing this table within what I can touch, within what I can see, and what I can smell. But who's to say that there's anything outside that door right now? Because until I walk out there, it's not necessary for it to be created in front of me. Just like in a computer game, when we, we, until you walk in the door of that computer room, it's nothing but numbers and, and, and patterns yeah. that are ready to be yeah. popped into reality for us to interpret. Do you think, though, that if somebody, if you walked out of here right now, you're a good guy, I don't think you'd do this, but if you walked out of here right now and you just found the first person on the street and killed him. Uh-huh. Do you think that what we're saying then means that that's a part of a simulation that we don't control, and therefore is that even is that even evil that you did? It's it's an evil act that you did that, but are you evil for doing it, or were you programmed to do that? Well, see, this is where where we're we're not quite connecting because the idea that we're in a simulation doesn't mean that we're Sims that are being controlled. I think that. Mm. because if, if what you said that that would be like some outside force says, Ooh, let's make the little guy yeah, down yeah, there yeah. do this. And maybe that happens. Grand but, Theft Auto. Yeah. But when I, <laughs> yeah, when I, you know, one time I was playing that game and, and, and I walked out and almost ran over an old lady for points. And that's when I decided I wasn't <laughs> I think I'm done with the video games. That was it for me. Oh, the shit people admit in here. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, literally, man, it took me a minute. And 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 that's a true story. It scared the shit out oh of me. Oh my God. But Oof. see, the the reason I brought up the the nature reality is because if it truly is, and and this is how it ties into free will or the illusion of free will. And there's guys out there a lot smarter than me that are gonna listen to all this and go, put that guy back away the box and came out. <laughs> But maybe not. Um, maybe not. Might be you know, something. Elon Musk didn't know anything about rockets till he read a book. That's true. <laughs> Got to start somewhere, man. But if you if if you can acknowledge that the universe and physical reality and and matter and everything is basically a simulation run by algorithms, which is pretty reasonable based on even what we know about science now, um, then how can you possibly have? a mathematics-based simulation that stays cohesive when there's 8 billion variations all all running ram, um, randomly. So in other words, if how can the program contain cohesive reality if every one of us is just this sporadic random thing that's doing anything and everything at any time and the system has to respond to that and still keep water blue and sky in mm. the air and clouds, it, it, the mathematics of that are almost impossible to comprehend. So, and, and how would it work? So my theory about free will and the illusion of free will is that we are, you know, sentient, creatures with our own allocation of spiritual energy that, that, that we are in control of. But as we meander through this simulation, there's certain key points where we make decisions that, that affect where we're going to go next. Like, are you going to marry her? Or are you going to run mm. away at the wedding? Are you going to give up that alcohol? Or are you going to die an alcoholic? Can you, are you going to become a drug addict? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? Are you going to go to college? Are you going to join the military? These are all key points in our life where we make a decision that radically affects our trajectory. That's where free will comes in. That's where we, uh, we so actually true. have that ability to make these decisions. But a lot of what happens after we make these decisions, I think, is part of like a predetermined, even if it's determined by formula. In other words, if, if A equals C, then D. Um, if he does join the military, then he's going to have these certain experiences all the way to whatever. Um, not that every life is pre-written, but that, but that it narrows down the possibilities and what you're going to do. So a lot of times, sometimes you're making a free will decision, but then sometimes you're on the ride that comes from making that decision. And every single thing that you do is not always free will. Sometimes you're the passenger in the car based on the decision that you made. And it's the only way that it makes sense for me for the, for the whole algorithm of reality to work. I'm not smart enough to come up with which one, like how it works, but I do got to admit, I enjoy the conjecture of trying to 
make some sense of it. Even if even if it ends up, and it definitely will, that we're like way off in multiple different ways. If there's something that can that happens in conversations like this with two people who are not scientists, right, right. here, I'm highlighting that that ends up being figured out in our lifetime that is like even on the right pathway. There's something about that mystery I think would be pretty powerful to feel. That's why it's cool that we get to record this on camera and right. you know, one day people can look back 200 years from now and be like, "Wow, they're fucking idiots over there." Like they had no idea or like, "Whoa, they knew like one thing by accident," you know? But when we start talking about what we get to decide and what we don't, that's where I I start to get stressed because I'm like, you know, I think of my life as you're in charge. I, not just that, like yes, yes, hundred percent. But also in what I'm in charge, you know, I'm a human. I make mistakes, but I'm always trying to do right. I'm mm -hmm. always I I don't like when people are pissed at me. I don't like when when I do something that then affects someone else in a negative but way. See, that's a free will decision that you made. Exactly. Yeah, not necessarily an action decision, but a character decision. Yes. So you're living the life that results from having made that decision. If you were a guy who at the core of your being made the decision that, hey, I don't care. I just want to see how many people I can piss off and how many viewers mm -hmm. I can get and how much you know controversy I can create. And I don't care if people like me and I don't care if I'm honest. Well, then you'd be living a completely different life based on that decision. But do you think that those decisions and... I heard, I think it was Jesse Itzler said one time, like there's like 30 to 50,000 decision points a human being makes a day, which sure. is crazy to think about. And they all use a different level of brain waves or however they explain it. But do you think that each decision that is made, which forms a decision tree, which means there are numbers we can't concept Well, see, of, I think that there's things that we think are decisions on a lower level. Like, like are we going to grab the Diet Coke or the Diet Sprite? that we think we're making that decision, but we're just living that decision because it's not that important. And if there's different frequencies that affect different <laughs> decisions in the brain, then maybe these decisions are being fed to us through these different frequencies and they're being reacted to based on what frequency that decision is. Right. It's either an order or a decision, but we think it's a decision even though it's an order. Bookmark that for a second. That's, <laughs> that's like, you just like ordered another pizza right there, but okay. That aside pretend for the sake of argument that most of these things actually are our decision. Okay. In air quotes. Every time we do one of those, could it be that there is there there are trillions of vibrations of a similar universe where we make that decision in a slightly different way that then affects everything afterwards? So right now I exist in unlimited infinite universes as a totally different person in a totally different environment where the butterfly effect since the beginning of time wherever that is affects us to the point that they all are completely different worlds yet somehow they may be similar well see you know that's a multiverse thing yes and then there's also a scientist named amika swami who says that all of these things exist but when we take a certain action they exist energetically and when we take a certain action they collapse that into that reality but that none of these other realities are actually happening in the same way that the reality we're perceiving is. And so like this idea that there's one you, right? But that you are the, the, the sole guy that is you, but there's all these different possibilities. And every time you make a different decision that results in a different outcome, you're not, you're jumping into this other universe where that possibility exists. And the you that is you goes there which is being occupied by a placeholder until you yourself go and the real Julian goes and occupies the, the Julian in that reality. It gets kind of weird. <laughs> but the whole point of why, why I'm bringing this up is because it's the kind of stuff I think about. It's mm. the kind of stuff you think about. Yeah. And and that's the whole, the, the point of all of this is it, it, in making documentaries about UFOs. It's because we're thinking about the mysteries of why we're here, what we are, and what it all means. And so few of us are making that commitment to puzzle that out. And if there's anything that, that I would say is, you know, why is that? Why are we so content, for lack of a better word, even though that's hardly anybody's content, why, why, is it a, why, why are people largely okay with just living in this, in this simulation, or if that's what it is, and they, they, they very rarely even think about it? I mean, I'm spending constant time puzzling this stuff out, trying to figure out 
what this is because I know it's like in the beginning of the Matrix. They said, you know, there's something wrong with the world. Yeah. And there's something wrong with the world. And if I'm going to be here, I'm going to work on helping other people to understand that there's something wrong with the world and I'm going to work on figuring it out for myself and what is the higher purpose of all of this. And it's in religions that do it. It's it's everywhere. But the the amount of people that aren't focused on that and that have lost sight of it, it's it's disturbing. But then maybe they're not even real, right? Maybe, well, <laughs> maybe they're just non-player again, characters in the game. Again, it's like, are you sitting across from me right now? Am I sitting across from you? Like, which one of us is the real one? Yeah, we could we could go off on that. <laughs> Subjective but, reality, consensus reality. Uh, yeah. The the thing I, I and I say this a lot, and I'll I'll probably say this forever, and I'll say it on podcasts all the time because I say it in my conversations with other people off camera all the time, but. I always try to remind myself, and I know I fail sometimes, but I try to remind myself I've only ever lived between these two years. That I you know of. Again, for the sake of <laughs> argument, let's stay on it. Let's stay on I've only ever lived between these two years. I think we need a direct line to yes. dominoes at this yes, point. Yes, <laughs> there's literally, like, we're like the meme right now, just popping them off. But just for the sake of argument, I've lived between these two years in the world that I know exists right here. Right. And all these other people, like, we study psychology. We There's science that studies patterns. We all know the anatomy of, like, human beings. But everyone reacts in the smallest ways differently or has different ways of thinking about things. And so... I do my very best to not be judgmental of other people. And I think it's a big part of what can hopefully make me yeah. successful in my job as well. And so, you know, people have different beliefs. They come from different environments. Mm -hmm. They have different motivating factors. They have different reasons for existence. And to me, the number one thing I look at with people is, are, are you a good person? What right. the fuck with you? Are you cool? Right? Like, you're a good guy. I like that. Everything else after that is great because we're talking about it on a podcast. But most importantly, like... I enjoy your company. And so, you know, when people aren't sitting around thinking about this stuff deeper, you know, think of like some of the stereotypical examples. Let's say you're 45 years old with a wife and three kids and you're trying to put them through college and, you know, you want to be able to have some time for yourself on the weekend to spend with family. And maybe that's what you get that time and, and that's what excites you and you're enjoying your life and you're not you're not necessarily worried about it. I'm cool with that. It doesn't mean that like... I'm not going to think about it, though. It doesn't right. mean that, like, I'm not going to talk about it on a podcast when I get access to people like you who think about this stuff. You know what I mean? It's not so much that, that you know, I'm okay with people on a mass scale not thinking about it. I do wish more people thought about it, but on an individual basis across people, I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge people for that. That, that's one place where, like, some level of ignorance is bliss is not the worst thing in the world. It's not like everyone can wake up to think about and prioritize all the same things that we do. But it doesn't make it any less stressful for me because I do think about it. Right. You know, it doesn't make it any less like, wow, what is it all to me? And I get through conversations like this on air and off air, I get what's the word like energized mm -hmm. from what from ideas people bring to the table like some of the things you've said today or now i'm gonna fucking think about all that and it's like you know it does all somehow come back to the core meaning of well what is the meaning of all of it pun intended yeah you know and so i do think about like what's a what is god what is that you know obviously einstein thought about it and you know we wouldn't have religion if if lots of people weren't thinking about yes. it and so the way people approach it in their own life has a lot to do with how they're re dealing with reality. And also it has a lot to do with their own inner journey that's none of our yes. business. Yes. And so we can't go out and, and, and blanketly say, well, people aren't paying attention to that stuff because we don't know that. Yeah. And and to judge them for that, you know, I've, I've, I've learned, it's, it's, it's been very hard for me to draw the line between what is judgment and what is observation. And, and I realize there's nothing wrong with observation. Like, if if, mm. if if we went out last night and you went on a bender and couldn't show up, well, I'd say, you know, that guy drinks too much and it's messing up his, the way he's doing things. That's not a judgment. That's an observation. If I, if I say, well, that guy's drinking too much, he's messing up what he's doing things and, and, that, and, and that makes him this, that is judgment. But just, mm. uh, just observation, there's nothing wrong with observing, you know, and, and people have a hard time understanding that it's two different things. You know, you can, you can, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer liked to eat people. Okay, that's an observation. Yes. Jeffrey Dahmer liked to eat people, but so he's evil. That's a judgment. Yes. So there's wow. nothing wrong with observing and even saying what you observed. That is not judgment. And so you're not judgmental because of that. You're observant because of that. Yeah. 
And 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 so that's an important distinction. It's an important distinction that I don't think a lot of people get. Which that's a judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Right around the circle, man. I know it's crazy. Now, but you 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 bring up the the religion point in there a little bit. We haven't really talked about this today. We talked about it with Congressman Tim Burkett. Yeah, Tim Bur- Burchett. Yeah. Burchett. Yeah, a little bit. But one of the things that really surprised me when I did the two podcasts with James Fox because that was the first time on this podcast where mm-hmm. we had delved into the phenomenon and you know ufology and things like that, but. I'm very active in in my community and in the comment section. I love to see what people are thinking, good, bad, and indifferent. And one of the, I, I get a good feel for just you know a, a a sample size of what types of people are watching the content, sure. who interacts with it. And the one thing that shocked me when I was going through a lot of the comments on those episodes is that, and I don't have to get into how. I figured this out, but some of them were even blatant about it where they were saying it. But right. a significant number of people who interact with this content and then even looking at other content on the internet to look through comment sections and see if the patterns exist there, which they did. A significant number of people who are highly, highly interested in this content are extremely religious. And to be even more frank about it, extremely, seemingly Christian religious. Mm-hmm. And I... I would have never expected that because, you know, you look at the Bible and stuff and, like, it's supposed to be, like, God, Son of Man, Jesus, like, right. all this. And there's no room. There's, like, you were talking about this earlier with me off podcast, but, like, it's, like, angels and demons and that's it. Right. And there's not really the room for the aliens. But the Tim Burchett example where he's a guy who looks at the Bible as potentially having Mm-hmm. having some draws to, to aliens. And then my little sample size looking here of commenters on the internet and seeing that a lot of people seem to think this maybe without saying it as blatantly out loud like that, that is fascinating to me because it makes me think that people, even who maybe you wouldn't give this credit to, are more open-minded than we than we think. Well, there's multifacets to this. The, the, the fundamental religious uh, belief systems versus the you know, the non-human intelligence question. So one thing that Lou Elizondo told me and that he's told this to other people and he said it in the show Unidentified, one of the biggest things, surprisingly, that he ran into with opposition within the Pentagon and within the Defense Department to the work that he was doing is that there was a very large contingent of people that believed that this was a demonic force, as in demons, <laughs> That and that we shouldn't be doing it. We shouldn't be investigating it. We shouldn't be poking the tiger in the eye. And that that was not just a little voice in the Pentagon. This was a huge group of people. Wait, they thought the phenomenon that was being witnessed was demons? Yes, within the military establishment, within the Pentagon, within DOD, there was a large number of people that opposed his work because they thought from a very, very fundamentalist viewpoint that we're dealing with demonic activity and that it actually affected his ability to move forward and get funding. It was it was one of the biggest oppositions that he said he ran into. And and he said that to me. I have it. He said it on TV shows. You can find him saying it on the show Unidentified. So this is not something that I'm just yeah, making yeah, up. Yeah. And th- then you have the other side of the spectrum where you have like Tim Burchett, who is, Tim. Tim is a Christian man. He's a Republican. He's a representative for the state of Tennessee. Very, very salt of the earth, very, you know, conservative views. But when I sat down and interviewed him, his feeling was, you know, if you look in the Bible and you look at Ezekiel building the wheel, there's a lot of people that think that that was a spaceship and and that's okay. And so, you know, there's another Mm -hmm. wing of, of Christianity that is okay with the idea. The Pope, you know, the Catholic Church came out a few years ago and said, there's probably life on other planets. It's okay. It does. It does. Wait, I didn't even know that. I should know that. No, they I... made an official proclamation. Really? Yeah, yeah. And um, fuck, I missed that. Christ. Yeah, they, yeah, they did. It was. It wasn't this pope. It was the one before. But they they acknowledged that there's probably life. Benny on... did it. Yeah, there's probably life on other planets, and that it's all right. And and so we have official religion mm-hmm. willing to entertain it. And I did a podcast on on some show, and I didn't realize I was I was on a completely Christian fundamental channel and i the guy's like no it's angels and demons we're not witnessing there is no nuts and bolts aliens and i'm like dude i will give you that there might be spiritual forces that are at play here and and i have no problem with that but i 
I'm not going to say that that's to the exclusion of there being other things at play. And, it, and they were just right down, the, just absolutely not. This is all, there's humans and there's angels and demons. And there's the battle of good else. and evil. Yeah. And so I find that challenging. Yeah. You know, because I was willing to concede that, that you know, part of his belief system as far as what he was seeing yes. had some validity possibly. I certainly wasn't going to rule it out. You know that, but but the idea that there's all kinds of things going on in this universe and we don't know any of them, very few beyond our own little planet, and and to to say that the spiritual answer of, of this biblical thing is the only answer to what we're seeing, I ju I just thought that that was that was sad that that's yeah. and and when I found out about stuff going on inside the Defense Department, along those lines, I was shocked, and and I talked to John Brandenburg that about my it. Mind that yeah. That happened. Yeah, it really did. And John Brandenburg, who's a very uh, a researcher who's done a lot of work about Mars, you know, he told me the same thing. He was working under classification as a physicist for a long time, and he said, "Yeah, there's a, there's a there's a big contingent that that fundamental religion, extreme fundamental religion, is governing what we are investing our energy and our time in." See, and I'm always very very careful about saying this because I want to be clear. I I respect people who have religion as, as a core part of their life. And I believe, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 90% of people use it for all the beautiful things. And I love it. Mm -hmm. That 10% can kind of ruin it for everyone, starting every goddamn war around the world for one uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, then you have the people who, you know, they're certainly allowed to believe what they believe but then when they're when they shut you down from even introducing something especially when you're giving them concessions like hey yeah, yeah you might be right about this or what the fuck do i know and they're still like no no it's this or it's that that's where you know i try to just back off and say okay you know just leave the conversation they're gonna believe what they're gonna believe don't let it affect you but it, it does piss me off sometimes because i'm like what do you know right have you been there did you go were well, you there for the Big everybody Bang? Everybody can like, say that, and yeah. and you know, but I think the key to to all the religions is at least you're acknowledging, you know, a fundamental spiritual aspect to to who and what you are. Um, but so am I. Yes. And just because I'm not going to drink the Kool Aid that you're that you're giving me with exactly what you're telling me it has to be, and there has and there's no other way, I can't do that. I'm on my own journey. I can't take yes. your word for anything. And so, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with what you're telling me. It's just that I'm going to make up my own mind. And it doesn't mean that, that it's really frustrating when, when you're, you know, you're a good person and you have somebody who professes that yes. they're a good person telling you what a bad person you are. Yes. It's like, give me a break. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, exception to the rule. I, I want to highlight that. Like I, do you view that as more of an exception? It it is frustrating when you run into it, though. I I, I yeah. share your opinion completely there. But like in doing all this, and you know, you said you started working on this in 2007. You were interested in it long mm -hmm. before that. It does, as we've said, I don't know, ten times now. It does come back to meaning of life type things when you're talking about extraterrestrial life and stuff like that. But like, do you personally? Like, what are your thoughts on where it all begins? Do you believe in in a god, or or what? Are you unsure? Well, you know, there's a lot of definitions of what God is, right? Yes. That is, is it some dude sitting on a throne, you know, ruling over everybody? It's like, oh, here, have a lightning strike. You know, I don't know. I think that there is certainly a, f a conscious force that might be self-aware of its own larger scale, but d is that the same exact thing that we define as God? Or is it this kind of collective energy of who knows, you know, like a sea of love that was everything before there was anything. I mean, obviously, the contemporary thinking, even among scientists, is that physical reality springs from consciousness, not the other way around. Mm. And we explore that in the movie. If consciousness sprang from reality, then that would mean that physical reality is the, is the root of existence. And we're finding out scientifically that that's not the case. And the most ancient religions teach us the same thing, all of them. Even, even um, biblical religion teaches us that this world is an illusion. And, and, and it's, it's stated very clearly. So if consciousness doesn't spring forth from this world, then it springs forth from somewhere, which is this sea of conscious energy. Uh, if you want to call that God, you can call that God. I call it God sometimes. You know, I'm not saying, I, I'm just not sure that there's, like, like we're getting so much attention that, you know, can you imagine if, if 
every aspect of our lives, and it goes back to whether we're making conscious decisions or not. How much supervision would it take to to supervise the whether you're going to buy a Sprite or a Diet Coke, and and, and keep that in, under consideration and keep tabs of it, you know, so that we can sentence you to to hell when it's all over. But you're thinking about it in terms of time and effort when that may not exist at that level of spiritual consciousness. Well, that's I th- yeah, I think it. consciousness, you know, it, it is all it is. Just like in the very beginning of the the first books of the Bible, I am that I am, mm. it, you know, and and so. To, if you want to call God the sum of all conscious energy that we are all a part of, I don't think that's in any diametric opposition to what even the Bible teaches us. Mm. So do I believe that there's a God? Of course. You, you can't believe that you survive the life of your physical body without believing there's something else. Do you think so when, do you have any opinions on what happens when you die? Um, there seems to be a pretty good body of evidence that consciousness survives death and that a lot of people have, you know, these experiences um, that are all very similar through the near-death experiences. The people that come back tell very similar stories. So, you know, do I believe that when I shut my eyes for the last time on this planet, that there's no part of me that's ever going to be, exist again? Not for a minute. Mm. I'm co- totally convinced. I think I'm with you. You know, I'll tell you something. We were talking about the multiverse thing. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, this guy came up with this thing called quantum jumping. His name was Burt Goldman. And... It's, it's about 20 years ago that he was making the rounds with his thing, you know, just like a, uh, you know, metaphysical thing that, you, that you're doing. So his theory that he would say to people is that there is another version of you existing in multiple realities, which you, you were kind of talking yes. about. And that these realities all exist. Now, Burke Goldman said that you can quantum jump, that through certain... Uh, um, certain meditation techniques and certain mental exercises and certain visualization exercises, uh, you can actually connect with these other versions of yourself and you can bring something back from them. Okay. Is this like man in the high castle type stuff? If you ever saw that? Yeah, kind of. read that? Yeah. But, but, but he's saying that you can do it for real. And he pointed to the fact that he was not a painter and he started using this technique and all of a sudden he could paint. Because there was another version of him that could paint. So, about the time of, when the pandemic hit, come was, on, twelve-inch dick, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's 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 quantum jumping on steroids. <laughs> Damn, it works. <laughs> come on, grow. Shit, I'm um, sorry. I had to, I had to, I couldn't let that one go. <laughs> Damn, and I was using it for something else. <laughs> if that worked, we'd just have a... <laughs> Who cares about painting? <laughs> oh, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was good. <laughs> yeah, that was anyway, good. quantum jumping, you were All talking right, about so, the painter. Stick with the, okay, with the so less sexual example. Okay, so this guy said that he was able to come back from another reality with, with some of the talent from his other version of himself. And I've, I've thought that was kind of interesting. When the pandemic hit, when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a rock star. I was all about music. Mm. And then my instruments got ripped off. I ended up having to leave home at a young age, and, and the whole thing got sidetracked. But during the pandemic, I picked the guitar back up and, was, and decided to start doing it. Well, I've been playing this quantum jumping thing. I've been doing some of the exercises, okay? In less than two years, I've gone from barely being able to play the guitar I believe that there's another version of myself that that made a go of music, and I've been trying to tap into that. And the progress I've made is off the charts. I'm getting ready to go out as a professional singer. I'm in a band that, that, that is being formed, and I'm getting ready to cut an album at, at 60. Where the fuck do you have time for this? This is amazing. Well, when I finished the movie, I decided to spend some time on music. So, Wow. But the but but I've been actually doing these exercises, and sometimes like I've got a singing coach, and she'll come over, and we'll be doing stuff, and she's like, "It should have taken you six months to get to that point. You did it in a week." And this should this is happening. It's happening to me right now, and I'm doing those experiments with connecting with yourself. I don't know if it works, but it, I've made a conscious effort to get in touch with this other part of me, and. And, and, and I'm getting, I'm getting better because at my age, not doing music your whole life, oh, it's hard. you have to be able to, you got, you're either going to have to make miraculous progress or give it up. 
and I'm, I'm making some pretty serious progress. That could be, I wonder if that's like a serious self-belief based on believing in that this could exist or if it's a combination of both, but either way, that's pretty trippy. Yeah. Quantum jumping. Quantum jumping. I'm not saying that it works. Yeah, I'm not yeah, saying yeah. there's anything to no, it. I hear you. I'm just saying that, that, that I've, as a musician, I've made probably 10 years progress in, in two years. And what's next for you? Are you, are you making another documentary? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one. My next one's going to be... See, the three topics that I've decided to cover in my career were the ET question, uh, the life after death question, and then the nature of reality. I've, I've got dozens of productions Good all three. around those three things. So the next, the next real doc that I'm going to do is going to be about life after death. And I'm okay. going to combine... I've done three ghost documentaries about ghost hunting, you know, electronic voice phenomenon, haunted houses, mm -hmm. walking around with cameras and people going, oh, that freaked me out, you know, that kind of <laughs> stuff. So I'm going to combine that with all of the interviews I've shot with the key NDE people, Eben Alexander, Marjorie Willicott, Jeffrey Olson, just pretty much anybody that's written a bestseller about uh, near-death experiences, I've interviewed them. Mm. And, and I've just been sitting on this stuff for a while. And then I'm going to combine that with everything that we're learning about consciousness surviving death and then the third in the series is going to be unveiling you know what is the nature of reality and are we in a simulation oh, I'm, I'm so, so there's three loosely affiliated films that are going to culminate in my key documentaries but at the same time i'm working on an animated series about mars and the spacex universe when I did accidental truth, are you I, quantum jumping between the different versions of you to get all the time for this shit? <laughs> no, shit. I just uh, it's all I do. Wow, you know, and and it's like um, because I don't do anything else, I just work. Where can where can people get the documentary? Amazon, Apple, everywhere. Yeah, it's it's all over. Um, yeah, Apple, accidental truth, accidental truth, UFO revelations. Forgot to mention that it's narrated by Matthew Modine, who plays, oh yeah yeah, uh, um, the Dr. Brennan and Full Metal Jacket Things. guy, right? Full Metal Jacket, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stranger Things, and he's coming out in the new Oppenheimer movie. Oh, very yeah. cool! I can't get, wait get for this. that. He plays Vanover Bush in the Oppenheimer movie. Vanover Bush was supposedly a member of NJ12, mm -hmm. the, the group that was put together to study the whole thing. So, all right, well, that, that's I, I can't wait for that movie too. Like that's going to be it's going to be really good, unreal. And I heard it's like three hours, but. This, uh, I will put the links to this in the description. Yeah, you can I, go I've to accidentaltruths.com and that's where you can get the t shirt if you want. Uh, so I'll put that as well. And, so, and, people and, can get and the also rent the movie. Very um, cool. But yeah, get the movie. It's, it's highly, highly informative. You did a great job and I really enjoyed this, man. Thank you for coming out from Arizona. And now this. you got the shirt. And, thanks and now for I got the shirt. Out. Thank you for the shirt, too. No, I'm, I'm really stoked that you brought me on because. The, you, you're reaching a whole other demographic of people than the ones that I'm going to reach through like MUFON or any of those other things. We didn't talk about MUFON. Um, we talked about it a little, but we didn't like go all the way there. We can talk about that next time. When we could on. do that next time. But you know, there's one other thing before we wrap up. It's a question that we, probably the biggest question of the entire interview. And, and I do understand how important it is. And so, you know, let's just dive right in. What, what does it say on that cup right there? Oh, do, do aliens drink? I don't know if they drink anything. I, I spend, know. you know, next to the nature of my own existence, this is probably the question I spend the most time on. Do they drink? Yeah, I mean, I ask everybody. I asked the stewardess on the plane the other day. She cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've heard sometimes they have a mouth, other times they don't. Yeah, they have a mouth, they don't. Sometimes Some people think they can, they can drink blood with their fingers and they, oh, you know. God. Okay. All kinds of crazy stuff. But, you know, I think that the fact that they found our planet, at least the person flying the spaceship must have been drinking because you wouldn't land here on purpose. That is true. That might be true. You might be onto something there. Ron, thanks for doing it, man. All right, man. We'll, I appreciate we'll it. We'll do it again. Everybody this has been else, epic. Everybody else, you know what it is. Give and it a throw. Give it back are. to me. Peace.